Welcome. My name is Kyle Martin, and I will be helping you get a good idea of what you need to get started with your CCNA, which means at this point, you've already made a decision that CCNA is the way to go for you. This is what you're going to be doing, and so on and so on. Now, this will actually give you direction for any course that you're doing as far as CCNA is related, because there are several tracks for CCNA. One we're going to be talking about mainly is going to be routing and switching. Now, routing and switching, again, these things that we talk about, same thing with the other, you know, wireless, voice, uh, data center. It's all the same steps you need to take in order to get through your CCNA. Now, of course, this is talking about routing and switching. So these names, are obviously, I'm not going to match up with your course names and so on and so on. So let's get started. First of all, starting from scratch, you're going to be trying to get a certification. The CCNA certification is what you're going to try to obtain. Now, if this is what you're trying to obtain, this means you have two ways of doing, doing so. You could take one exam, and this will be an exam that you literally go out, sign up for it, and you drive to the location where the exams are taken. You pay your money, and then at that point, you sit down and take your exam. Okay, cool. But you got two ways of doing this. You can actually take the two exam track. The one exam track is really for those people who need to recertify. Let's get that eye out of there. Recertify. Now, recertify means that they've already had a certification. We just say recert. They've already had a certification and they are going to try to bring that certification back. Maybe that certification expired and or maybe they are an instructor and they just want to go back and take the, the new exam that came out. That's what, you know, that's that's one of the plans that I that's one of the things that I plan on doing. But this exam is a collection of two structured materials. And those structured materials is called ICDM1, ICND, ICND2. So ICND1 and ICND2, these exams are two separate exams that you would purchase and try to get a passing score. Now the passing, passing score for the exams is 80%. 80% of the questions. Average questions length is about 60 questions. You could say 50 to 60. Some of them might even say 45 to, to 55, 45 to 60. You usually have a time frame of 90 minutes to finish these exams. If you're new, to CCNA, new to Cisco training, new to networking. And when I mean new to networking, I mean training in general. If you've been in the field for five years and you've never taken a certification exam, this doesn't mean you go right in and try to take the CCNA right off the bat. That, that's, that's not what I mean. I mean, if you've never taken a certification at all and you've been in the field for five years, 10 years, this is what you need to do. ICD in one, ICD in two. There's more to taking an exam than just knowing the material. There's a lot of mental things that play a factor in you taking these exams. There's a lot of understanding how the exam is functioned and structured. And it's nice to be able to fail and say, you know, I lost, you know, $125 uh, compared to I lost, you know, $250. Because whatever these exam cost is, if this exam is like 150 and this one's 150, then it's going to cost $300 to take this exam. 
if you're new to certifications, please take these, the, the two exam routes. Now, if you decide that you're going to take the two exam route and you passed ICND1, you have this interesting certification that is called CSIN. Now, CSIN means Cisco Certified Entry. That E and T is entry level. That means you pretty much have an entry level to networking. This certification, not really. I, I mean, it's nice to have, you know, you, you got something out of it, but you need to be a CCNA because the CCNA is the basics. And if the CCNA is the basics, then this entry level is really just the entry to the basics. And you need to keep that in mind. ICDN2. Now, ICDN2 is your exam that would allow you to get your CCNA exam. Now, this is also very important to know because if you take ICDN, uh, ICND2 first before taking ICND1, then you don't have you have no certification so let's say you decide that you're going to take ic nd2 you're going to take this first well that means you are nothing yeah, i mean it's that's the certification you get nothing then you go back and take this one second now you become a ccent and a ccna so it's kind of weird. So nonetheless, they love to call this the CCNA exam, but it's not. It's not the CCNA exam because if you need both of them to actually get your CCNA, then taking ICND2 does not make you a CCNA unless you have the other one. you got to have them both. I personally wouldn't worry about it. I personally would say flat out, look, I'm going to take ICD1 first, then I'm going to take two, then I'm a CCNA. I wouldn't try to figure out if you're trying to be a CCN or a CCNA or so on and so on. Now, this is very, very important to understand how your exams are structured. Now, how do we find out information about this exam? And that's what we're going to go to next. And I'll pull up a web browser here. And I'm going to type in cisco.com i'm gonna hit enter the nice thing about cisco's website is right up here it says training and this training you just let it just let it ho hover your mouse over it and it brings down this nice little menu over here you have a certification section you have your entry levels and your associates and your professionals and your experts we want to worry about the associates and right over here we can click on ccna now, if we click on more, this will give us all the associate, associate, the associate exams. Now, the associate exams, let's take a look at them. CCDA, this is your design associates. NA, data center. Now, the NA means network associates, but this is a data center exam. Routing and switching is what we're going to be talking about. You have security, you got service provider, you got service provider operations you got video you got voice and you got wireless so there's lots of types of different ccnas regardless of what ccnas you decide to tank i strongly suggest you take routing and switching first i really do i really strongly suggest you take routing and switching before you take any other ccna track that's just a personal opinion of mine now Based on saying that, if, you, if you're going to do wireless and that's what you want to do and you want to get your wireless done immediately and you're like, I'm not dealing with, I'm not dealing with routing and switching, you know, forget that. Uh, you know, I'm on a time frame. I'm, I'm going to get my wireless CCNA. Hey, I'm not going to knock you for it. I'm not going to knock you if you never get your CCNA routing and switching and you take your CCNA wireless all the way up to expert. I'm not going to knock you at all. No one's going to. You know wireless. That's, that's the track you want it. That's what you want it to do. It's just a recommendation, so let's keep that in mind. So we're gonna click on CCNA routing and switching. 
you can want you can watch the video if you want but i like to come down here and take a look at this information right here this is very important it's very nice to know if i need any other exams in order to actually take this exam which i don't now if i actually go back Click on training again. We're going to go to do the professional level. And we're going to click on CCMP, which is our writing and switching. And if you can see here, it tells you that we have to have a valid CCNA writing and switching. Or any CCNA or CCIE certification. Which is kind of funny If I'm going to be doing CCMP routing and switching, and I have a CCIE and wireless, and I've never done anything with routing and switching, assuming that assuming that wireless does not have routing and switch, switching technology into it, that means you know there could be a missing step in that foundation by going through the CCNA training. This point I've never understood. But this part I do. There's no reason for you to have a CCNA or a CCMP unless you have a CCNA. So we're back on the CCNA. We don't have to worry about any requirements to take this exam. And we have this recommended training. When he's saying recommended training, it's clear as day that this is required training. I don't know why they say recommend a rec a recommended training. Maybe this is their training that they offer, but that would that would take you to their network, their network training section of the website, and that's that's uh, is that where we're at? I don't think this is where we're at. This is the course objectives, and maybe this is it. Uh, yeah, okay, here we go. So you can enroll here. And uh, go to the um, network university is what I was talking. It was what I was trying to say. There's a virtual classroom, so maybe that's why they're telling you that that's recommended training. From here, they're saying, "Look, you could take this exam. This is our composite exam. This is our accelerated CCNA. What this exam is." is questioning you on this exam and this exam, which means we have a mix of these questions rolled into one exam. You might think that's easier, but I'm telling you, if you go this route, it's best to use this for you to recertify yourself, not to start off from scratch. Now, they give you the exam numbers. These exam numbers are something you should know. Not necessarily memorize, but it's nice to know what your exam numbers are. Because there's nothing worse to schedule your exam, go to the testing spot, and there's lots of times you go to take your exam, they ask you, okay, what exam number were you supposed to take? And then you're drawing a blank. It's always best to write down your exam number before you go take your exam, before you get in that car. So they also have some other information on here, which is pretty nice. It'll give you, you know, self-study material, uh, Cisco Learning Network. I said Academy, but it's the Learning Network. And let's say take exam. Some more information here. It'll give you the option to register the exam. But let's go back and click on this exam right here. 100 dash. 101. This is the ICND1 exam. This is what ha this would this will be your CSET if you got it. And let's see if they give us some. I'm looking for pricing information. That's what I'm really looking for. All right, you're going to have to go into the person view. It seems like to actually get the information. I'm assuming Cisco took this information off their site so they would not have to update the costs and update that information every time uh, it would change. And, and it was really an easy thing to find, but apparently now they're making it to the point where you have to log into Perseview. And I'm not doing that because I don't have a Perseview account and I'm not setting one up. 
So uh, that's something that you have to do. Either call them or read some blogs and find out uh, how much these exams are. I'm not going to do that now because reading someone off a blog, not getting the information from Cisco or Person View themselves, it's not something that needs to uh, be promoted. So at that point, that's where we're going to leave it. Now, when you come here and look at... the beginning of your CCNA information here, which means we actually clicked on routing and switching. We're gonna look at one of the exams. Now don't click on this, this, this one here, click on the actual number and the exam. We click here. Now I'm sorry, you know, I, you know, I always drink tea when I'm actually teaching, so you will hear me consistently pick up the cup and drop the cup. And I apologize for that, but that's part of the uh, course experience with going with me. Now, let's look at exam topics. Exam topics gives you this idea of what the percentage of the test is going to be. Now, you can click on the detail button here, this little arrow, and it'll give you more information of each one of these and what, which each one of these bullet points are going to be underneath each one of these sections. Now this section says operations of IP data networks. Now this is the main category, which is operation of IP data networks. And underneath there, we got some in interesting topics. And each, each one of these topics has even subtopics underneath those. But this is these are the bullet points that Cisco is gonna bring out to you saying this is the information you need to understand. Now, let's look at this one. Identify common applications and their impacts on the network. Now, I want you to understand that these books are probably going to be, for ICDM 1 and 2, are going to be about 800 pages. Now, that's 800 pages. Do you really think that we can kind of give an idea of what 800 pages is for each one of these concepts? Like configuring and verify and verify VLANs. Okay, that's nice, but it's not really it's not really giving you detailed information. Now this one is though. It's talking about identify basic switch concepts and operation of the switches. It talks about collision domains, broadcast domains, way uh, ways to switch, which is store, forward, cut through, cam table. These are specific details. So there's some specifics in here and there's some vagueness in here I don't use these a lot of people do notice that I just clicked here to save view exam details and it pulls up the entire list already in a PDF format and you can view it all some people use these as guidelines I don't like using this as guidelines because again it's vague so do not get scared with all this information because you're, it's new. It's all new to you. And part of this being new is the fact that you're learning this stuff. You're not going to understand it because you have no idea. Some of you don't know what VLANs are. Some of you don't know, you know, storing a switch as far as, you know, stating a cut through and forward. You don't know what these terms are. That's why you're learning it. And because you're learning it, that's why you're not going to understand what these are. So the exam topics is pretty decent. Then we go to recommended training. And this most likely is going to take you back to Cisco's learning network saying, look, this is some recommended training we have. There's nothing wrong with that if you want to go this route. There's lots of training material out there for CCNA. And this is how you use the website. This is how you get started as far as trying to figure out exactly what it takes to get this information that you need in order to find the details of the exams on Cisco's website. All right, and that's pretty much it with that. So we're gonna close this page out. So remember, you wanna take the two exam route if you're starting off. And if you take this two exam route and you actually pass, you will become a CCNA. 
Now, from here, you're going to find that the CCNA will attract not what I want to write here. You will find out the CCNA will attract certain jobs. Sometimes I actually write down what I'm actually saying and still do this right now when I, when I want to write. Uh, it's very easy. It's kind of like, you know, making your, one, making your left hand go in a circle and trying to make your right hand go in the opposite direction. So this is going to attract to certain jobs. You might find that these type of jobs that you're being attra that that's attracting towards your CCNA are not jobs that you're really looking for. Remember one thing: when you are trying to get into this field, you are looking for what type of positions? Networking positions. I mean, why would you go out and get a CCNA wireless, and you're going to be doing security? You wouldn't do it. So when you're going out to get your CCNA routing and switching, you're going to want to do routing and switching things. But remember, this is an associate. And the purpose of a CCNA is and always will be, even though this is trying to be changed, they're trying to change to be the, the, the purpose of the CCNA, but it's never going to change, ever. The CCNA is meant for one thing no matter what they tell you that it's meant for it is meant to prep you and give you the basics for ccmp that's exactly what it's for you should already have in your mind that ccna is the basics and prep to get to the real stuff here now remember this is if you are a networking dude if you're if, if you're a Microsoft dude and all you want to do is just get some basic understanding of networking, oh yeah, CC, CC, CCNA is all you need to go. CCNP is not necessary for you. You don't need to go to that level because at that point, getting to the professional level means you're trying to be a network guy. Now this is very important to understand because you want to have some type of direction of where you're going. So, scoring. Scoring is pretty simple. Scoring, unless they've changed it, and you can always do your own research, but scoring, the lowest score you can get with an exam is 300. The highest exam, the highest score you can get for the exam is 1,000, which means you got 1,000 because you got everything right. And I mean everything you got every question right you didn't miss one beat your passing score needs to be 80 now this isn't really 100 percent math here because if you actually did the math you could you could do it like this and you could say all right the i could possibly get 700 points 700 points we times that by 80 that gives us 560 well, if the 560 plus the lowest score is 300, that gives us a score of minimum of 860. And we can, we can say that, okay, my passing score is now 860. But that's, that's, not, that's not the way it happens. It's not an exact science in that fashion. So when you get your scoring report, after you take your exam, you will immediately know if you failed or passed, which is nice. You'll get it printed out. The company that you, where you take your exam, they will print that out for you. Yes, there's been times when I've walked in there and they said, you know, sorry, our printer is down. And that's bad. It's not bad if you pass. I've It's happened to me on a passing. I was just like, I don't really care. I passed. I was so excited. I was just like, I don't care. And, but at the same time, when you have a failing score, that's not acceptable. And you need to have them find a way of printing that out for you. It has to be done. Because in that failing, with that failing score, it's going to give you what areas you are weak at and strong at. 
And if you've got like 30% on a particular topic, like network fundamentals, well, that means you're missing something there. You need to go back to network fundamentals and restudy that that whole broad section. And that's what kind of that's what kind of sucks because it's really a broad section. Network fundamentals, what is that? I mean, that's that's a lot of stuff to cover. And if you only got 30%, you don't really, you can't really remember what questions were network fundamental questions because it could be a network fundamental in their eyes, but not really in your eyes. So, and Cisco isn't 100% clear what's what in all cases. So just keep that in mind. So on that sheet, we'll tell you what the passing score is. So the passing score could be 811. Let's just say it's 811. That could be the passing score for that exam. So at that point, what do you do from there? And that's what we're going to start discuss right now. How many questions? We already showed that and how to get that information. So there's no point of covering that. Now, Now, what do you do when you fail an exam? Let's say your passing score is, uh, we'll say 815 is your passing score. Which means you need to get an 815 at least to pass. And you come back and you get a 700 score. Now, this is what normally happens. At this point, you're mad, you're upset, you're depressed because you spend a lot of time doing this and so many people come back to me and they say i you know i don't know what to do man i mean i worked my butt off yeah you did and it shows that you worked your butt off you got 400 points man i mean you need to understand that if the passing score is 815 and the lowest score is 300 you can't get lower than 300. That means you need to get only 515 points, plus your minimum of 300 score, right? And out of those 515 points, you literally got 500 points. You can look at it that way, but it'll start confusing you. The best way to look at it is, dude, you got 700 points. You have studied so hard and so good at this point that you were able to get 700 points. You only got 115 to go. This should never be depressing, but it always is. Because you spent, let's say 150 for the exam. You spent, let's say four months prepping. And you felt you were ready. And that is, that is the thing. I am ready. Bingo. Here's the key right here. I am ready. You were ready to take the exam. You just wasn't ready to pass yet. This is this is normal. You can't expect to study and just walk in there and just just ace it. Sometimes you will be able to ace those exams, but not always. But man, you got a 700 score. That's fantastic. You should be walking out of there saying, okay, I failed, but boy, I, I did something right. Because if I did everything, if I didn't do something right, I wouldn't have gotten 700 points. And this is very crucial for you to understand this. This is this behavior that you have at this moment of failure dictates everything. Because at this point, if you look at this as failure instead of a 700 points of success, you're going to go home and you're not going to come back to it. You're just going to sit there and be depressed. It is okay to be depressed for a day or two. Do not allow your depression from failing this exam to last more than two days. In fact, I personally say take the next day off, sit there. Cry your tears, do whatever it takes to get that depression out, and come back to studying the following day. Some people take two days. Your first failure is always the hardest. After that, 
It should be a fail. Let's get right back to it. Guys, 700 score is not depressing. It shows you it shows you that four months ago, you wouldn't even gotten a 700 score, I can guarantee you. You would have got probably a 300 score. You learned 700 points of materials. That is something to be proud of. The worst person I ever had come to me, the worst person, is when the passing score was 815 and he has a 714. This is no joke. Now, these numbers aren't accurate, but he was only one point away. He showed me the paper. I'm like, dude, that is great. It's like, go schedule it for next week, man, and just go back and do some, you know, some serious labbing for the next week. And go over your materials and all your notes and just, just crush it when you come back. He never went back to the exam. I couldn't believe it. Don't do that. Don't do it. Okay? And that's pretty much it for the introduction to what you're going to be doing. And next, in the next video, we're going to be discussing... some needed material for you to do some studying. And that's what we're going to talk about in next exam. Now, the second thing we need to discuss is needed material. As with any course that you're going to take, you're going to have to have some type of material to help you along. And starting off, books is one of those materials. Now, you'll find all types of books out there for ICDM1 and ICDM2. There's Cisco Press Books, which I find to be very great books. As far as the new Cisco Press Books for the new CCNA, um, you might find it a little bit more, a little bit more technically challenging as far as to read that type that, that book to to get the foundations. So you might want to start off with another type of book that'll get you some CCNA skills that kind of gets you started in a fashion where it's easy reading to you because this stuff there's a lot of there's a lot of things that you're going to go through with your CCNA and the and the worst thing that you want to go through is trying to understand what you're reading and having a hard time dealing with what you're reading then there's a lot of books that are written but that are that are written by Cisco Press and those authors do a great job but there's also some books that aren't really that great. Just like any press book that you might read, uh, there's some great ones, there's some okay ones, and there's some pretty bad ones. So with the new CCNA, which will be the 100-101 exams and the 200-100 uh, exams, and let's actually look those up real quick, make sure we get those numbers correct. And we do that just by going to a website here, which just take, seems to be taking a sweet time to come up here. We go to Cisco's website. Not sure why it's taking forever. And find exactly well, maybe if I actually type in Cisco, correct? That might be a reason. There we go. And let's go to training here and let's go to CCNA. And we will be able to find those books sitting right here. 100, 101, and 200, 101. Now, these books are kind of your guidelines. 
there's two type of books you're going to be able to read. You're going to read actual learning books and you're going to be reading reference books. You get to choose which one you like to follow. I like the reference books because they're nice to go back to whenever you want to find quick information. And it also teaches you about the technology as well. You might find that Todd Lamley might be a good book for you to read. And um, you might find that someone else is a good, per a, a good one to read. But this is something that you want to spend some time looking at. And I don't mean lots of time. The last thing you want to do is spend all your time looking at books and not doing your studies. But find a way to maybe go on safari. When you find a book that you're interested in, read a couple of chapters or maybe... <clears throat> read a couple pages of that chapter and see how it flows and if you find yourself kind of having a hard time reading the reading the actual the paragraphs you might find that the entire book is that way obviously go later on in some of the chapters do some more readings and gradually just go through paragraph by paragraph and just find out how you know how how it flows with you and that's really, really important because the last thing you want to do is scratching your head and telling yourself, telling yourself that you can't learn this because of the fact that the reading seems that you need to be this highly intelligent person to be able to understand and obtain this information. Okay? So books are pretty important. And you want to get the ICDN 1 and 2 books if you're going for those exams. Don't get the CCNA books. Again, that will not be prepping you for the ICND 1 and 2 exams. So make sure you get those particular books. Routing TCP IP Volume 1, the second edition by Jeff Doyle and Jennifer Carroll, is a very, very good book. However, as a CCNA, you might find this to be a little bit too much for you. You might find, you might find yourself feeling that way. And the reason why it is... Why you why you'll feel that way is because of the fact that it is, it is too much for you as a CCNA. This really gets in depth. This is the kind of book that you would like to have if you want to read on a particular topic and really want to get granular with it. But it's definitely a nice book to have. Definitely one to have. Not something you need for your CCNA, and not something that you need to get immediately. As far as, as far as getting to the CCMP level, I would start thinking about purchasing this book and having it there, reading the first couple of chapters, especially with IP, uh, especially talking about TCP IP, and just leave it on your bookshelf and go back to it when you feel that, you know, like if you're getting into OSPF, you feel that you're not really understanding it, you can go back to a book like this. This book's expensive though. When I purchased it, it was $90. So I don't know how much it'll cost now. I'm sure on Amazon, it will be a little bit cheaper. Now, computer-based training, these CBTs. Computer-based training <clears throat> is literally what you're getting now. That's, you're listening to me talk through a video about this information. And I'm sorry that I have to keep clearing my throat, but. So, Computer-based training is, is a very, very, very strong necessity nowadays, especially in the fields that we're doing. It is a necessity. Watching someone configure these devices, the routers and the switches, via video is more powerful than any book in any fashion that you can imagine. But computer-based training is something that you really, really, really need to really need to get involved in <clears throat> because you came here obviously video based training is what you were looking for so this is a really really good thing that you've came and, and and went on this path now if you decide that you want to get your ccna the only way you're going to really be able to attain the ccna is by using equipment which means you need to find a way of having routers, switches, they need to be connected to each other. You definitely need connections and you definitely need the ability to get into the CLI, which means you're gonna be logging into these routers into these switches 
and you're going to have cables connection, uh, connecting these devices, and you're going to be on the command line all throughout your training. If you do not have this ability, you would not be able to pass the CCNA. The CCNA has interesting things. The questions are set up in a way where you can't just read the book and just get past it. Unless you have a really photographic memory and remember what exactly output you're going to have with show commands. And what's a show command? Show, show command is just to show you what's going on with a particular device. There's lots of different types of show commands. As far as if I say show version. Well, this command shows me the version of the operating system that I'm using, how long the router has been up, and so on and so on. In a book... It will show you the command, and it might show you the output underneath. But unless you physically type this show version in, you're not really getting a good feel of the output. And unless you have a photographic memory to remember what that output looks like from a show version, it's not, it's not going to make sense to you when you step into the exam. Why? Because your exam, you only have 90 minutes to answer about 50 questions. And that only gives you about a couple minutes. And if it only gives you a couple minutes, and it's kind of less than two minutes, because really 90 minutes, if it was two minutes per question, it was 50 questions, I would give you 100 minutes. So it's a little bit less than two minutes per question. And if you have to sit there and search for information in output, and not just have your eyes drawn to that, output section that you're looking for it's you're wasting time so these exams are really not testing your skill set only yes it's testing your skill level but it's also testing your exposure now this is very important to understand exposure means that when i do a show version the first time i'm gonna have to search for the output but by the time I've done show version the hundredth time, well, you know, that output's going to start, really just start coming off the screen. I'm going to be able to know exactly where I need to look at to find the information I'm looking for. If I'm looking for, if I'm looking for the uptime when I do a show version, I know where to go. I know where to look at it because I've had to go look for the uptime many times. My eyes are going to be drawn right towards it every time. So this is very, very important to understand. The exposure part means that they're just going to, for a question, for a particular question, they're just going to give you output. And they're going to just start asking you questions about that output. Because you have done and done a particular show command that shows you that output and you've done that command like a hundred times, well, that output that you're seeing becomes natural. It becomes, comes, you've been exposed to it for many times and for over a period of time. It's a very smart way to actually set up exams. And it works very well as far as giving your heart a difficult exam to pass. Now, you have several ways of building your labs. Now, when I say a lab, your lab is going to consist of equipment. We call it a lab because obviously it's not in a production environment. You're not using it for anything but to practice your studies. So we call it a lab. It's just like a scientist. They have certain projects they have to do. They have certain work they have to do. But when they're in their lab, they're there to what? Experiment. So you will get equipment so you can do your experimentation. So now, I recommend three routers and four switches. This is what I recommend. Can you get away with it with three routers and two switches? Yeah, you could. But there's a certain topic you're not going to be able to learn with three with two switches. And it's a very important topic. It's called spanning tree. You will not be able to learn spanning tree with just two switches in a, in a decent fashion. And the reason why I recommend four switches is because having four switches to learn spanning tree is much better. Gives you a much better understanding of spanning tree. 
Three switches is normally the norm when people are teaching Spanish tree. I like to teach Spanish tree with four switches and more. A lot, most people usually get three routers and three switches and leave it at that. There's nothing wrong with that. Because remember, I'm not, I'm not expecting, neither is Cisco, expecting you to be an expert at expanding trade. They just want you to have an understanding how it works. This is CCNA level stuff. So even though I recommend four switches, if you don't have the money, three switches is fine. But you're not going to really learn expanding trade without the three switches. And if you feel that it's not necessary to get a four switch just because of one topic, that's understandable. Now, when you get your routers, you're going to have to have these things called WIC 1T cards. They give you the ability to plug in serial cables. And as you can see here, here's our serial cables, some th straight through cables, just regular Cat 5 cable, Cat 6 cables, some crossover cables for your switches. Okay, you can get an access server, which is not really necessary, and a USB to serial adapter. So let's talk about each one of these. And the first thing we're going to go out and look for is our routers. And now this is where it gets fun because now we go shopping. If you're going to buy equipment, it is up to you to research what equipment you want. Asking somebody else what equipment they should buy, it's it's not you've lost the personality you lost the personal touch out of it. It's not really your lab. I mean you're building your lab could be just like somebody else's, but you didn't really put the time in, you didn't do the research on what you really needed. Doing the research could be as simple as going out and reading somebody else's blog and finding out what's needed. Doing the research could be going on on to Cisco website to find out what's really needed as far as the equipment that you need. First thing I'm going to type in is Cisco. And I'm going to type in 1900 switch. This switch is steadily sold as a CCNA lab. Now I need to tell you this. Even today, this is being done. Now, let's take a look at this. Because it says 2950. So let's see exactly what this lab consists of. It says 1900 switches. And that's exactly what these are. Oh, okay. It, it cuts off there. These are 1900 switches. I was suspecting, hoping to see the actual Callus number over here. The this, this switch number. It tells you you're getting one 2500 series routers, another 2500 series routers, and you're getting two 1900 switches. Now, I need you to understand something about these 1900s. As this person, and he's still doing the same thing five years later, he's still selling the same thing. It says our CCIE experts have designed this lab in such a way that can implement CCNA. Labs, equipment of this lab has been fully tested and guaranteed to work. No CCIE expert is doing this. Because no CCIE, no CCMP, and no, not even a CCNA in their right mind will, lit, will literally advertise or tell you to get 1900 switches. Guys, you cannot do CCNA with 1900 switches. These switches are menu based and does not have the proper iOS on there. But again, it's a free country. These people can do whatever they want. All right. I want to show you this because you have to make sure that these are the switches you do not get. And when I bought my first lab, I spent $300 to only realize, and I got the routers, I got three routers and two switches to only realize that... I couldn't even use the switches. So I had to use packet tracing to get through my studies, which I did not like at all. I wanted the real equipment. 
So the 1900 switch is the main switch that I'm going to tell you not to get. Six, uh, the Cisco 25, 2950s is all you need. You can see they're around 30 bucks, $20. Well, let's do a bite now because those could be. And, and again, this is at the time that I'm doing this now. You have to understand the time that I'm doing this now is time that, uh, you know, the date that I'm doing this, that, that's, that's a major thing there. Does that make sense? I mean, whatever date and time this is right now, this is what's going on. You know, you could be watching this movie, this video, uh, five years from now. And obviously these prices will, will be a lot different. So this one's 30 bucks. Twenty five fifty. This will do everything you need to do in a CCNA. Everything you need to to do. Now, if you want to get a switch that would do CCNP and CCNA, I would recommend the thirty five sixties. Now, the thirty five sixties, yeah, they're a little bit more expensive, but this switch would take you all the way through your CCNA and CCNP, and in fact. It, depending on what version of CCIE you, you would be doing, I'm using these for my CCIE studies at this moment. By the time you get to that level, the, the exam could definitely change. So 3560 is a good switch. I like the 3560s compared to the 3550s. You could also get 3550s. They are cheaper, but the 3550s are heavy. They're bulk. They're they're, they're bulkier. Than the 3560s and they draw more power <clears throat> and it's not so much power that you're going to really notice the big difference but and they're, they're also a little bit louder too now these switches again are if you want to get to the ccmp level the difference, the main difference between this switch and the twenty, the twenty nine fifties is the twenty nine fifties is just a layer two switch, which means it can only do switching. These switches, the thirty five fifty and thirty five sixties, are layer three switches, which means they can do switching and routing. And you need to know, you need to have this when you're doing your CCMP studies. Cisco twenty five hundreds, really cheap. You can see they're 20 bucks each. It's all you need for your CCNA. CCMP might not do you too good. So you might want to jump up to the 2600s. And you're going to want the 2600 XM series. Let me scroll down here and try to find some. Uh, so 40 bucks. Looks like these are 80 bucks. Yeah, anytime you see the anytime you see the router sitting there, uh, it's best match. That's why I was like, why why are we doing this here? Let's go to lowest price first. Let's make sure we're doing two hundred per page. Let's try to get down here to some routers here. Might be page two we need to go to. There we go. So we're looking at about 80 bucks, 100 bucks each. It only has two pages. And these are the 2600 XMs. And again, they're about $100 a piece, and it looks like they're just raising it, rising in price here up to a couple hundred bucks. You should not be spending $200 for a router. You need to understand that. So uh, something's going on here. I don't know why they're charging so much money for those. So let's go to the 2800s. 2011s. And we'll scroll down here. And we'll go to page three. So, uh, again, there's plenty of these. They're around 100 bucks as well. So, you might find them for 80, 75, 60 a piece. So that's going to be pretty much the highest cost of your route, you know, of your equipment, depending on what type of switches you get as well. And of course, you're going to need the other things that I have on the list. If you 
Two things I want to say. You're going to need serial cables and serial cards. We're going to talk about serial cards in a minute. But when you get your device, make sure they have pictures of it. Make sure it's not a standard picture that they just got off the internet. You want the, you want pictures from someone who actually took the pictures. And again, they're not really showing you anything. They're showing you the model number. And then they're showing you this router, the back of the, 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 the technically the, technically from, from whatever perspective you want to look at it, this is the front of the router because it has the faceplate there. But technically to us is the back of the router because uh, it doesn't, that's not where the ports are at. So again, you are not really looking at what type of device this is. You want to know how many ports is on that device. And here we go. This one has a much better picture. Notice that I have two fast Ethernet links. Don't just assume because a model number is, is, is on that faceplate that you have two fast Ethernet ports. You want two. It, it will it's gonna be you're gonna be very upset if you actually buy the equipment and next thing you know you only have one fast Ethernet and you said you did the research, that's the proper model number. And you don't know what's going on. Anything can happen. Face place could have been the face plate could have been replaced, uh, replaced, and it could, it could have been a mess up. So make sure that you have two fast Ethernet ports. So our To get your serial, ports, you need to buy these serial cables here. Uh, mine are only three feet, uh, three feet or six feet. I think mine are six feet. I think mine are six feet long. Uh, mine sits in a rack, so that's why. And here is a WIC 1T card. They're around 14 bucks. This guy apparently is selling his for five. But again, this is what they look like. This will give you serial interfaces. You could also use with 2T cards because each one of those cards will give you one serial interface. And with the 2800s, you're going to be using, you're going to have two spots to put your WIC 1T cards in. So you got to pay attention to that too. This is what the WIC 1T cards look like. The cables, I'm sorry. This is what the cables look like. They're smaller serial cables. And this is what the cards look like. Now, the nice thing about these cards is notice that you have two on here. Instead of just one. And that's nice. So that means each card has ser uh, two serial interfaces. So if you only have one slot, you can still get two serial, in two serial interfaces. If you have two slots, you can actually get four serial interfaces. So that's nice. So up to you, however you want to do it. As long as you have some serial cables and some Ethernet cables. Because your, your serial cables are going to be connected from router to router, simulating your internet connection, so to speak. You know, simulating your WAN connection, going from router to router. And your fast Ethernet are going to plug into your switches, simulating a LAN environment. And that's how you're going to set up your lab. So here... We also need straight-through cables, Cat5 cables and USB to serial. A USB to serial doesn't matter if you put does not matter if you put Cisco in front of that now. You can just put USB to serial. This is this is what it's going to look like. Uh something like this. Uh no that's not that long. Let's get Uh, you know what? Belkin is a popular one. So let's take Cisco out of here. And let's just put Belkin. Cisco doesn't really make those devices, but 
this is and again this is like 15 bucks this is what it looks like you're turning a usb into a serial adapter and that's what the end of that cable looks like this allows me to plug in a blue console cable and those cables look like this There's blue ones right here. That blue plug right there will plug into the USB to serial. And then your other end, your RJ45 plug, will plug into your console port. We say USB to serial because what will happen is once you put the drivers on that on your device and plug that USB device in, you would literally get a serial connect a connection. A COM port, a communication port in your device manager, and there you can connect to any Cisco device. Access Server allows you to connect to that device, and that device will be a bridge for you to connect to all the other devices. But for a CCNA, again, it, it, you can get one if you want. I never used ser Access Servers until I got to the... CCIE level, really. I, I just literally just kept moving the plugs from end to end. Uh, then I started using Telnet, and then I eventually got an access server. And it, and it might not have been CCIE training. It might have been in the middle of my CCP training. But that's how I did it. There is virtual methods. One's called GNS3. You can go out and find information on how to install it, so on and so on. You need the real iOS. The iOS is Cisco's operating system. If you do not have the real operating system and have no means of getting it, there is no reason for you to use GNS3. However you require the iOS, not my concern. However, what is my concern is you need to know that GNS3 is just an emulator of the hardware. It does not have the software. GNS3 is used a lot. It's easy to set up. It is a program, so you might have problems with it, like links not working properly, the router is not working properly, so on and so on. If you have an ESXi server, you can run IOU. Now, IOU is not available to the public. Again, however you acquire that is, is not my concern. However, do realize that if you have IOU and it's not a release to the public version, which at this moment, they don't have one yet, then you use this at your own risk. It's the best way I can say it. One issue that is free if you have an ESXi server, or just VMware, you can use VMware too, like Workstation or Player, is CSR1000Vs. The problem with this is, they say it requires 2.5 megs of, of RAM. That's what it says. Now, I have 48 gigs. And I have ran 24 routers. Now you can do the math. And you can see that that is 48 gigs plus 12. Because you got the 0.5. Or plus, uh, plus 6. So that's more than what my EXSI server has. But it runs them all. And I use up about uh, 24 gigs of memory. I did say megabytes over here, didn't I? But it's 2.5 gigs. So I use up about 1 gig per router on an average. When it boots up, it will use all the RAM when it's, when it's booted. But once it's quiet down, once it's gotten to the command line... It averages out about 24 gigs, maybe 25. 
So that's also an option. So if that's the case, if you had wanted to get five routers, then you would probably be using up about six or seven gigs of RAM. You could do that on a machine if you have more than eight gigs of RAM on your on your PC and use VMware Player or VMware Workstation and get them to work that way. Now, you need to understand one thing. None of these do switching. Except this bad boy right here, it emulates switching, but there is weird behavior with switching. And this is why a lot of people are going after IRU or trying to find ways of getting it. I find it to be so buggy that I don't use it at all. Uh, and not to mention the fact, it's not something that I use on a regular basis. I use real equipment. So IRU has no interest for me, none whatsoever. I have tested it on people, other people's machines just to find out that it, it, it really has a lot of bugs in it. Now, Cisco training for CCIE does use the IO, IOU version or their maybe their version of it and or a different version of it. And they're running updates all the time and it is more stable. But there's also certain things that you can't use and can't do. Packet Tracer. Packet Tracer was originally a training tool for the teacher to teach networking to the students. But now schools just give Packet Tracer away or give it to the students as a means of giving them their own lab. And of course, www.bolson.com has simulators and em not emulators, but simulators to simulate your routers and switches as well. So if you can't afford the hardware, there are other options. Okay. Now, from here, which one do I prefer? Well, I'm a man who loves his equipment. I love my I love having my hands on the equipment. I love listening to it boot up, having the sound in the background. I have a touch and feeling type of relationship with it. I have the you know, when I'm doing things, I can actually look at the device. Especially when I'm moving data, it's pretty cool to watch those lights flash when you're going from one, one device to another. It's cool to watch a, a, a switch operate in spanning tree. Watch the lights go into amber mode. When they're being blocked. It's pretty cool to have equipment. One thing that I like about equipment is I don't have problems with my equipment. The only times I have problems with my equipment is if they don't boot and I might be a bad WIC card. And lots of times I don't have bad WIC cards. I've swapped that WIC card out with another router and both of them work fine. It's just something about that WIC card in that particular router. I've had had routers die on me. Uh, so far in the five years, I've only had two that got to the point where it was just unusable. Unfortunately, one of them was my access server. And I just, I had to buy another one. Real equipment is the way to go, in my opinion, because of the fact you don't have to worry about nothing as far as issues with the software, issues with, um, with your learning, because... GNS3 does some weird things. Like I said, you could have a router sitting here. You can have a router sitting here. Router 1. Sitting over here with router 2. Connected. Sitting over here uh, on a switch. Now remember, when you're connecting your routers to a switch in GNS3, these are real switches. Real physical switches. And GNS3. GNS3 only does routing. Your CSR 1000 Vs are just routers. Now, things can be working great, and all of a sudden you've lost communication between one and two. It's just not working. And then you find that everything's working fine. It's just this link here is just acting weird. 
do you delete the link, bring it back up, everything works fine, or you delete the link, bring it back up, doesn't work fine, then you find out it might be the router. It's just something about that particular object. You delete the router, bring in a new router, and everything works fine. But you don't have that with real equipment. It works all the time. It's not guaranteed 100%, but I've never had a lab not work out because of the fact that it's my equipment. Now, what's going to happen is if you start having problems with GNS3, you might start questioning and saying, hey, you know what? Um, is this a GNS3 thing or is this me just making a mistake? I used to copy things from my GNS3 routers and bring them over to my real equipment. And as lots of times, it worked just fine. But there was also lots of times, which was most of the time, my configuration was wrong. Whatever behavior that I thought was weird that I was seeing on GNS3 mimicked the exact same behavior as it was on the routers and uh, routers, the real routers and switches. It didn't take me long to just leave GNS3 in a virtual world alone and just stick, stick with real equipment. But again, this is going to cost you. Total lab will cost you about three fifty to five hundred dollars, depending on how cheap you go and what equipment you buy. That's the average of a CCNA lab. If you're building a CCMP lab first and just use your CCNA studies on and just use it for your CCNA studies to start off, which means you're going to buy a CCMP lab enough to because this lab will get you through your CCNA all the way through your CCMP. And you don't have to worry about redoing equipment when you need to make the transition. Well, if it's a CCMP lab, it's going to cost you more. So let's keep that in mind. And that's pretty much it as far as us discussing, uh, uh, discussing this topic about what material is needed. So if you have any questions, any concerns, definitely do some research. Get the books that you need. And try to find out what if you really want to go with that real equipment route. I personally recommend it. I think it's a great experience to have. I think it's worth the money because that money that you're using is, is just educating you more. Okay? Okay, scheduling. Study schedule is extremely important. Number one reason for success out of CCNA candidates is consistency. Number one thing, consistency. So consistency means this. Think about you studying for one hour a day. One hour a day. So by the time you started on a Sunday and looped all the way back around to this Saturday here, to Sunday again, that'll give you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight days of studying. But the total of eight hours altogether. Now, I want you to think about something. If I, was to, if I was to teach you CCNA just to go through the topics, just to quickly show you the labs, which is what I don't do, but if I was just to go through it, quickly show you the stuff, not take the time to really lab the technologies, not to show you extra things as I'm labbing, not to slow it down during the labbing process, a course will take about... 60 hours. 60 hours. Now that 60 hours means that we could go through and study for about 12 hours a day for five days. Now if you did this, if you study for 12 hours a day for five days straight, you would, you would obtain maybe 10% of the material. 
So that means out of 60 hours, you might actually retain about six hours of that information. Now, I want you to think about this. That means you go out, you take your, you, you, you do 60 hours, and you sit in front of that CCNA exam, and you're lost. It, it, that test, that exam crushed you. I mean, crushed you to no end. And the reason for that is because you really wasn't prepared. 60 hours isn't enough to be prepared. And definitely doing it in five days, it's just not going to happen. So let's think of this. Let's think of another strategy. Because one hour a day gives you eight hours a week. And if that eight hours in each week, if you did that, and just to take the course... That will be seven weeks. I'm sitting trying to think, think about how we're going to do this. Seven and a half weeks. Seven and a half weeks, which means that's eight hours a week and seven and a half weeks. That's two months. Could you do the CCNA in two months? You could. Is it the average? Not by far. Could you do it with eight hours a week? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Now, let's think of this. If eight hours a week isn't enough, and that's still seven and a half weeks, which will give me about two months, could it be done in two months? Yes, I did it in two and a half months. But I was not working, and I still spent every breathing time that I was awake on my CCNA studies. I tried to do the CCNP in six months. That, that didn't happen. And it was actually double that time. Now let's think about this. If I studied four hours a day, four hours, that means in a seven day period, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that'll give me 28 hours in that week. And even with four hours a day and 28 hours a week and eight weeks, I cannot expect to pass this exam. That's what I really want you to understand here. If I did 28 hours a week for eight weeks, that's 224 hours of study time. Two months has passed, I will be I will be a lot farther off than I was. But in most cases, I would not be prepared. Now, if you're doing this every day for four hours, four hours isn't that long. It goes by pretty quick. The consistency is what's really important. Which means I would rather you study every day for 30 minutes than study here, come back next week, study here, and uh, now I'll probably take some time here, and maybe some time here, and some here, and then, hmm, yeah, because, you know, I have a busy, busy week, so that means my week, you know, I had a wedding to go here, uh, this was a birthday, and, oh, oh, you know, I was, I, you know, I have my softball game here. I always take, you know, uh, this is my uh, other friend's birthday. Because, I'm man, you'd be surprised how many people that I talk to where their entire schedule is birthday, weddings, and parties. Man, it's Friday night, man. Why would I want to study? It's drinking time. 
Mom, sorry, Saturdays is with my family. And then you'll start to realize that your calendar is filled with sporadic study times. And the next thing you know, 12 months goes by. And you know what you tell me? You said, I have been studying for my CCNA for a whole year. And I still can't get this done. Why is this? Because you haven't really been studying. You haven't created a schedule to stick to it. Yes, this is that cliche. You know when you read the books? They're like, how to get rich quick? And they always say, set goals. Set a schedule. And you're like, oh, come on, man. I've heard all this crap before. I understand it. I have to set goals. I have to, I have to set a schedule. Yeah, I get it. I understand it. But then when you go to your studies, you're not getting it. You're not understanding it. It's not clicking. It's not clicking because of the fact that you're not studying consistently. Now, let's do some math here. Let's say here you study for four hours, four, 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 and four. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. That's 24 hours. Right? So that's 24 hours of studying that you did sporadically. Now, if I took 30 days, 30 minutes a day, including Saturday and Sunday, and take that, it's actually 0.5, and times that by 30, that'll give me 15 hours. 15 hours of consistency. Now, you're going to say, well, Kyle, obviously, it's better to get 24 hours. Well, let me tell you. When you start on Tuesday and it's time for you to study, and you don't, and you study for four hours, then you're going to skip one, two, three, four. You're not even going to think about Cisco. Then you're going to come back to su Sunday. By the time you get back to studying, at least half of this stuff has been gone, man. Time travels so fast when we're doing this because it's so much information that we're trying to obtain and we're trying to get so much done and accomplish that a whole week of not studying, you just, you just, you, you've lost a lot of information. Your memory has literally kicked it to the side. This is realistic, which means this 15 hours of consistency every day you're going to be sitting there going over the material every day, every day. Somewhere down here, you might get to a topic right here. Let's not put an X there. Some here, somewhere down the line, you might get a topic here, which will force you to go back a couple of days to say, well, I don't remember this. I, wait a minute. I don't remember. As you're sitting here, you're like, I, I I don't remember. That's not what this said in the book, was it? Or my favorite thing is, uh, what does that acronym stay, stand for again? And then you got to travel back. You're looking at things. STP. What does STP stand for again? Oh, yeah. Spanish Tree Protocol. What does that do again? Well, let me hop back again. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. So when you're taking four days off and, cut, and trying to hop back, you're not even going to remember when's the last time you actually read that. Now you're spending a lot of time trying to go back. This is, these 24 hours of sporadic studying in that month is a killer of lessons. Consistency. How do I feel about 30 minutes? You're not going to get anything done in a 30-minute period of time. Hell, there's there's times when it takes you to set up a lamb because you're so slow. It might take you an hour just to get the routers to communicate. It might take an hour for your router to, to really, your routers and switches, really to get up and working. And it could be something just as simple as this. There's router one. There's router two. Connected. Here's a switch. There's a switch. Connected, 
Connect it. Connect it. And it might take you an hour just to get this set up. And you're like, why? Why would it take that long? Well, troubleshooting. You might forget to put clocking here on one of these routers. You might forget to know exactly... You might forget about clocking altogether. You can't figure out why these interfaces won't come up. You might have put a, this particular port in a VLAN a couple of days ago and totally forgot it. Then when you went to go do a lab, you're not realizing that this is a different VLAN than this switch over here. Might, it might not, you might be confused on that. So you got to troubleshoot. So a half hour is nothing, guys. If it takes me 60 hours to teach your course, and that 60 hours still me teaching you 60 hours, that's nothing compared to what you have to do after the course in order to learn the things that you need to learn. Oh, wait a minute. Are you telling me that if I study for 60 hours, five days straight, I'm not going to be ready for the CCNA exam? No, you won't. Because this 60 hours, you're listening to me talk. This 60 hours, you're watching me do the configs. Everything looks great when I'm doing it. Even when I screw up, which you'll see me do lots of times. And I go back and fix a problem. You're going to be like, oh, okay, that was simple. I can do this. This looks great. Everything looks great when someone else is doing it. You watch someone rock climbing, it's like, yeah, I can do that. I wouldn't want to do it, but I could do it. Parachuting, I could do that. I could fall out of a plane. No big deal. But until you jump out of the plane yourself, it's a whole different ball game. Until you get your hands on this equipment and configure it, it's a whole different ball game. For me to configure two routers and two switches would take me minutes. Could take you 30. Could take you six times. 30. Could take you six times. The uh, six times the amount of time could take you 20 times when you're starting off. So what is the recommendation? Lots of people have different type of recommendations. I want consistent studying, not brain busting studying, because it's going to be brain busters anyway. When you get home from work, let's say you get off at 5 p.m., you walk through the door, let's say you get home at 6 p.m., you kiss the wife, hug the kids, 6.30 p.m., you're in labby. And you're labbing until 10.30. Now, you want to eat with your eat with your family, that's fine. Six o'clock, you walk the door, hug and kiss the family, sit down and eat. By 7 p.m., you're finished. Now, when I mean by 7 p.m., you're finished, that means by 7 p.m., you're sitting at your table in your lab, which means you have a place where your lab is sitting. Might be in the basement, might be in a different room. Either way, you have a lab that's just for your equipment. And at 7 p.m., not 7.01, but 7 p.m., you're sitting right here. And you lab until 11 p.m. You shower, you go to bed. Now, this is a hardcore stop at 11. At 11 o'clock, you shut it down. Which means at 11.01, you're not labbing anymore. You're shutting it down. Because by the time you're done, you're going to go up there, take a shower. You might be getting to bed around 11.30 to 11.45. And of course, you got to get up at what time in the morning? 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. And you need at least six hours of sleep. At least six hours of sleep. Guys, I cannot be more adamant on this. You cannot go through CCNA training or CCMP training without proper sleep. 
if you push yourself to 12, 1 o'clock every night, and you're going to want to do this, and in some aspects, there's nothing wrong with pushing yourself. It's when you push yourself the first time, you're going to constantly do it. And the next thing you know, you're going to start getting really, really messed up. And when I mean messed up, your studies are going to suffer because you're not getting the proper sleep. Once that CCNA bug hits you, and when I mean bug, that means you got bit on the back of the net by the Cisco, Cisco bug. This becomes more than just something that needs to be accomplished. Doesn't happen to everyone, but a lot of us, it does happen to. And if you got that Cisco bug, you're going to want to lab and lab and lab and lab, especially in your CCNA days. That labbing becomes addictive. You're learning. You're learning at such a fast rate. All this new knowledge and concepts. Your brain loves it, but it needs proper sleep. This is the schedule that I'm talking about. You have a set schedule. You don't vary from it, which means you've already talked to your family and your wife. I mean, your family and your family and your wife. Your, you've talked to your wife and your family, your children, and you sat them down and you've told them. This is what I'm going to do. It's going to take me four months to do it. I need this time. Every day you're going to be downstairs. You're going to explain to your wife how this CCNA is going to prove your life. But it's just a stepping stone for the CCNP. And that CCNP will improve my life to the point where it could possibly double my income. Maybe triple it depending on how much I'm making. It will give me the skill sets that I need to work on large enterprise networks. It will make me valuable in this industry. And if I want to excel, this is what I need to do. And this is what you're going to tell your wife. That she's going to be supportive. And then on Saturday, Saturday and Sunday, your key days. Because Friday, you're still going to bed at 11 o'clock, man. No, 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 no. You're not staying up to drink with your buddies. You're not doing it. Throughout your CCNA, tra CCNA days, those days are over. Your weddings, birthdays, going out on Friday nights, it's done. While you're going through your CCNA. If you don't do this, you won't have your CCNA in four months. You'll have your CCNA in a couple years if you stay consistent with those two years. And two years is a very long time to get your CCNA. When it should be done within four months. And those who go through it for two years still don't have the foundation that a lot of people have with the sacrifice of the four months. And I should tell you something, how that longevity of studying sporadically doesn't pay off. So Friday night, you're in bed, 11 o'clock, 11.45, 11.30, 11.45, same time. Saturday, you get up. And still, 5 a.m. in the morning, just like you would when you're going to work. And guess what you're going to do? You're going to lab. Because when you get up at 5 a.m., you're going to stretch, you're going to eat, so on and so on. So that means you're sitting at your PC at 6 a.m. And of course, if you, if you normally get up at 6 a.m., then you would start at 7 p.m. You lab until 10 a.m. Your family's not going to get up until probably around 10 a.m. on a Saturday. And guess what? This is the most greatest part of your Saturday and Sundays. Because Saturday, you get to spend time with your family because you've already put your four hours in. Absolutely not is what I'm going to tell you when it comes to Saturday and Sundays. Absolutely not are you to sit there and say, I'll lab in the evenings because you won't do it. Are you, do you see what I'm getting at? Your Saturday and Sundays, your labbing needs to be done first thing in the morning. If you want to be successful with CCNA, you got to have sacrifices. And sacrifices mean you gotta you gotta limit, you know, eliminate certain things in your life, and that's getting up at noon on the weekends. Okay? So Saturday and Sunday, you're going to do this, which means you're going to get your hours in. By the time your family wakes up, boom. 
Now you got the whole day spent with your, uh, uh, friend, your family on Saturday and Sunday. The worst thing you can do is get up with your family on Saturday and Sunday when they get up at 10 a.m. and go in there and laugh until 2 p.m. Because by the time 2 p.m. comes around, guess what? Dude, you're done. Your brain is finished. You're tired. You're done. You want to play games for the rest of the day. So these Saturday and Sundays are very important. You get up first thing in the morning. You study by 10 a.m. Your family's up. They're going to have their breakfast. You're going to be having your second breakfast. Call it brunch if you want. Because you're already ate at 6 o'clock in the morning or 6.30 in the morning. Yes, that means you have to cook your own breakfast. Because the last thing you do is study while you're, while you're uh, hungry. Guys, this is a golden formula. So let's look at this. 7 p.m. 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. All the way through Friday. 6 a.m. And I'll actually just say 7 a.m. Just, just, just in case you're going to get up at, normally get up at 6. Which means you normally get up at the same time you would on a, on the weekday. But remember, you're going to bed at the same time. The reason why we like to get up on Saturday because we love to stay up late on Friday. That's why. If you go to bed regular on Friday, getting up on Saturday like you normally do during the week, it's not an issue. Unless you spend your time going through and sporadically sleeping at different times during the week. Something you really should not be doing throughout your studying. And yes, it might sound petty, but it is important. Here, we'll say you start at 7 a.m., finish at 11 a.m. Same here, 7 a.m., 11 a.m. You know what time I used to get up? I used to get up at 4 a.m. By the time I was done at 10 a.m., by the time my family got up, I had six hours of time in. Man, that was great. That was fantastic. I'm not telling you to get up at 4 a.m. But I am telling you to get up at the same time you normally do, normally have done through the week. Now, at 11 a.m., when your family is waking up, their hair are all messed up, they're wiping their eyes, you've already got four hours of studying in. Technically, your family, if they're getting up around that time, around 10 o'clock, technically, you might even get another hour or two sleep in. Because, you know, on Saturday, people are just lounging. No one's really doing anything on Saturdays most of the time. And if your family does want to go somewhere, it's not a problem. You can just get up and go. And if you are that person that just lounges around on Saturday and Sunday and play games, guess what, man? You got gaming time now. I mean, that is the thing right there. There's nothing better than getting up on a Saturday morning, doing your lessons, and by 10 to 11 a.m., you are done, man. And from 11 a.m. to what time? Until 11 p.m. Guess what you get to do? If your family is just lounging around and that's what they do on weekends, you get to game. And gaming is so much more sweeter when you don't have to, when you can't do it throughout the weekend. I mean, throughout throughout the week. It is so much sweeter on that Saturday. It is a reward every Saturday and Sunday. You get the game for 11 hours if that's what your family does. Maybe you get the game 11 hours on Saturday, and then Sunday you guys go for walk, go pick some fruit, you know, if, if you live close to a farm. Go to the farm, pick up some fruit, pick up some vegetables. This consistent studying is very, very crucial. It is a necessity for your success. Some people will try this and only get two or three days in a week. Hey, it's better than nothing. But if you have that attitude, it's better than nothing, no matter what you do, you're going to say that. You're going to say, well, you know, hey, man, I studied one hour here on Monday, and I also did another on Tuesday. Then I also did one on the 23rd. Hey, man, that's three hours, man. It's better than nothing. Actually, it's not. 
In fact, it's you might as well have done nothing. Personally. So very, 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 very crucial. Now we're going to end it there because we need to understand that sacrifice is part of our training, which means we have to realize that between the 7 p.m. and 11 p.m. every night, if you if 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 11 is too too much, hey guys, at least get three hours in. Don't make it less than three, though. I mean, I can literally say by the time you've done three hours Monday through Friday, that's 15 hours a week, man. That's that's a good day. Even if you don't do it on Saturday and Sunday, hey man, that's 15 hours a a week. I said a day, but 15 hours a week. That's still a good time, man. That's not something to, to, to say, you know, I, I can't, you know. That's nothing for me to look at you and say, you only did 15 hours a week? Oh, man, that's horrible. I can't look at you and say that. I can say 15 hours a week? Hey, man, it shows me you're doing something. Now, that doesn't mean 15 hours this week and then you do five hours this week. Uh-uh, no. Consistency. This is what you need for your CCNA, CCMP. CCIE, totally different story. But CCNA, CCMP, this, this is the type of schedule you want to keep on going. Okay? And we're going to end it there. And that will be the, uh, this will be the third part of our How to Get Started with CCNA series. And um, I'll see you in the next video. So one of the things that I would like to tell you is video training does not give you everything you need. What do you really get out of a course? The missing parts of your studying deals with the concept of not getting everything that you need. Video training is a supplement to your reading. Reading is a supplement to your video training. And your video training and your reading is a supplement to your labs. And your labs is a supplement to your video training and your reading. If you believe that you're going to find all the answers you need in one spot, this is going to set you down the path of providing you holes in your knowledge. What does holes mean? It means you can set up VLANs, but you really don't know what's going on in the background. You don't know what you don't know, so at the same time, you could be creating traffic where that VLAN is really leaving your, that traffic in a particular VLAN is really leaving your VLAN. And in your mind, that's impossible. It can never leave a VLAN. Once it's in a VLAN, that's it. Because you, that's your perception of the, of the technology. And when that traffic starts leaving that VLAN and weird behavior starts happening, you really don't know where to look. It's the concept of not knowing what you don't know or not knowing the unknown. You can't foresee something if you don't know that it's going to happen. And even when you do when, even when you do know what could happen, doesn't mean you're going to foresee it anyway. So this is a very very important lesson to learn. And you're going to learn it either by listening to me telling it to you or you're just going to learn it the hard way anyway. I personally like the hard way, as long as the hard way does not take 10 years to figure out the lesson, okay? Now, this is actually configured as a router, I mean a switch, and it's a router, so I'm just going to say hostname router1, and we're we'll clear off the screen here. Now, I'm going to go do some show commands. Show commands, you, you really don't know what they are yet, but... We're still going to go through them, and one of them are one of them is show and the question mark. Now the question mark allows you to see all the commands after that show command, which is which is pretty nice. And I'm going to do show interface. Let's see what commands I have after that. All types of interfaces, but I'm just going to use the command that says brief.
And it's show IP interface brief, by the way. Interface, not interfaces, interface brief. This gives me certain output. Now, again, you might be able to read and see this output in a, in a, in a book, but do you know how many times you do show IP interface brief throughout your labs? I mean, it is one of your number one commands you do on a regular basis. Show IP interface brief is one of those commands you at your CCNA you're going to do a hundred times. And all of this is going to start becoming familiar with you. You're going to know the interfaces are sitting right over here. You're going to know this. I mean, right when you're looking for a particular interface, you're going to see it. You're going to know that the interfaces are in numbered or are in sequence. You're going to know that if this was serial zero zero, it will be zero 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 one zero two until it went to the one series and then it'll say one zero one 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 two. You would know the IP addresses over here. What will, what will eventually happen, it becomes a part of you. This output becomes a part of you. You know right off the bat, serial one four oh. I mean, right off the bat, doesn't have an IP address. This is the first thing that's going to start popping out after a while as well. This word administratively. This it tells you that this interface is not going to work. It's shut down. So let's bring this up. Let's bring up this interface. Don't worry about the commands that I'm doing. You are going to learn all these commands eventually. I'm bringing up this interface. There it is. It just, just came up. And I'm going to say show IP interface brief. And there we go. Immediately, I know that this is up and this is up. Right off the bat, I know this. My eye, my eye is glued to this. I know this output. I know it like the back of my hand. Because I've seen it a hundred times, a thousand times, multi-thousands of times. Now, what if I give you this output from this command? Show up here out. That's a lot of stuff to, to think about. Especially when I got a routing table that has 20 or 30 routes in there. Maybe 5 or 10 routes might give you an issue. You got all this information up here as well. Well, eventually, this information, will you're, you'll get used to it. You'll know whether you need to look up here or not. It's not something that you're really paying attention to. This information, this IP address here, you'll know what this means. You'll know what this directly connected means. You know what this fast Ethernet 00, zero means. And you'll be able to go through a routing table and just pick up information like that. But if you're really going to book... Will you be able to do will you be able to do this without the power of seeing it a thousand times? And this is the missing part that people have when they go through their CCNA and CCMP without labbing. Guys, if you're serious about your CCNA, which means you want your CCNA to mean something, which means when you're done, you have a real skill set, not just a piece of paper saying that you know that you could take an exam. You want a real skill set to go with your exam you're going to spend 50 percent of your time studying and the other 50 labbing which is also studying i come across a lot of people and i mean a lot who believe theory is the way to go theory is the way to go and some of those people come to my classes and they sit down and, and they sit in my class and they have a lot to say. They have a lot of thing about theory. But when it comes down to it, they can't troubleshoot anything. To them, traffic flows in a certain way. Which means if they were in a real environment, their asset wouldn't be that high. They wouldn't be that high of an asset. And their mind, they know the theory in and out. But do they really know it? Because in order to really understand how the theory matches up is by really understanding how this equipment works you can't everything is needed 
guys. You can't have 80% of, uh, of, 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 the, of the equipment time and 20% of theory. And you can't have 80% of theory and 20% of your lab time. They go hand in hand. CCNA, you'll find yourself a lot of theory starting off. Then you start getting into equipment. And then you start to realize that you're still doing theory and equipment. Then you get into the CCMP, same thing. Theory and, theory and equipment. And then when you get to the CCIE level, that's when that theory starts to transfer over to you getting a lot more theory, but mainly it is equipment time. Now it's time to really understand what these things are doing. And that's funny because the only way to really pass an, to pass an expert exam is to know the equipment in and out. What it does when you type in a command. Lots of things are happening when commands are typed in, not just the output that you see. So this, these are the missing parts. These are the parts you get holes in your knowledge. You know the theory very well. You have a good memory. You memorize the stuff in the book. And it's all great. And then they're going to give you this lab. And they're going to show you some output like this. And then they're going to ask you a question, where, what IP address is my, is my route going to go? And you're going to be like, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I mean, you're just showing me this output. I mean, I don't, I don't have an idea. They might even give you a lab where they'll say, we'll give you the ability to log into this router. We want to know the IP address of what the, of the connected router is. I mean, how do I know? Well, because you've never labbed. You don't know how the, equip, the, equip, uh, the equipment functions. You might do a show CDP neighbor. And you'll be like, okay, well, there, there, there's the router, um, uh, which is a switch. Let me go ahead and ping switch one. Uh, nothing. You know, that doesn't work. Um, um, what do I do? Um, I, I don't have a clue. Well, maybe you're smart enough to actually ping the broadcast address. Hmm. That doesn't work. Maybe I can do show CDP details. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, you're not going to see an IP address here. Because of the fact that <laughs> there is no IP address on the other, other uh, side of the switch. But see this entry, I, uh, uh, entry I addresses? This is where your IP address will be. So if I actually went over to switch one, let's do that now. I'm going to go into interface VLAN 1, say IP address. And I'm not going to really teach you what I'm doing because you're going to learn all this in your class. Let's do a CDP neighbors now. Nothing still. And it takes 30 seconds for the CDP to come over. But let's do this. Let's uh, first show IP interface brief. Let's first make sure we can ping that address. Make sure we don't have any other issues there. All right, so we are able to hit it. So let's do a show CDP neighbors now. And there's the address. This is a real simple lab to have in a CCNA. You know, I said I said last year and the year before, I think it was really last year when I said it, but in one of the classes I said before, the last thing you guys want me to do is create CCNA labs or simulations. Because I find that most CCNA candidates are missing one aspect, one strong aspect of their learning. And that aspect is spending 
more time on that equipment. They're so busy getting the CCNA that they're not spending the time to learn the CCNA. And that's the problem. And that's why I'm here to, uh, to prevent. There's lots of training courses out there, guys. Try them. There's lots of them out there. But here, we lab, man. That's what we do. We understand what's going on. We take the time. Some topics are heavier than the others. Some topics we just flat out ignore. Because you can't cover it all. If I had to cover every... If I had to cover all 1,800... Uh, all 800 pages... You'd be bored. You'd be bored by the time you're we're finished. Plain and simple. So this is a simple command to be able to see what my neighbor is. Now let's try to ping the broadcast address. And there you go. Okay, so that would have worked as well, but. No, in Cisco, they would have eliminated this, the broadcast, or maybe they're not. Maybe they feel as a CCNA, there's a couple ways to find out. Okay, so the missing pieces that you normally have in your in your knowledge is by you leaning on one of these aspects. You're heavily reading books. That's fine. Add some video training to it. Use it, use the video training as a supplement. If you're heavily, if you're really heavy in the video training, that's fine. Use some reading to supplement with your video training. But one thing that I can't say that's okay, that 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 it's okay not to do, is not lab. You need to be labbing. So these missing parts that you do throughout your studies puts holes in your knowledge. It makes you it makes you weak when you get to that command line. And when you get to that CCMP, and, and it's time to learn your CCMP skills, you know what's going to happen? You're going to have to go back to your CCNA's study anyway. You're not going to want to. You're not going to want to have to go backwards. You feel that it is going backwards, and it's not. You're just going back to pick up what you should have learned in your CCNA. Again... Don't expect to learn it all. There's lots of things you're going to miss throughout your CCNA studies. The objective is to become strong with the skill set that you learn. And to be able to have CCNA level knowledge. And that is a lot of skills that needs to be taken into consideration. A lot of things to learn in your CCNA studies. And that's pretty much it. All right, so you've gotten this far, fantastic. So one of the things that I would like to discuss is your direction, your flow of studying, okay? So let's say you decided that you're going to take your CCNA, your routing and switching, okay? And then you decided you're going to take your CCNA voice, and then you decide that you're going to take your CCNA wireless. Now, you decided to take this route because you felt that these are the major things in our industry. And you would like to have a good basics of voice, wireless, and routing and switching to make you more valuable to a company. Okay? Not saying that's the proper way of doing things, but... Nonetheless, that's what you wanted to do. Now, as you can see, we are going in a horizontal method, okay? And this is the path that you have chosen to take. You chose to take a horizontal path. Now, if you decided after your CCNA routing and switching that you wanted to go for your CCMP routing a switch and then your CCIE router and switch, Okay, this is what we call a vertical study method. All right, so you need to have some type of method of how you're going to do this. This gives you a broader range of knowledge. However, remember when you're going in this this method, you're still just a CCNA running and switching, and a CCNA and voice, and a CCNA and wireless. And my recommendation to you all is to take it to the professional level. Being associated is great, 
but being a professional is 10 times better okay and that's and that's no way there's no way to argue this fact uh this is just the industry the way the uh, way things are uh you would do a search for ccna and you might find that you know you're not getting the jobs that you're expecting to get uh when you get to that ccp level and uh put this on your resume you're finding those jobs that you're looking for are coming in and in fact you might find yourself uh kind of behind in studies uh you might find that the the jobs that are coming in are a little bit more much or, or i should say a little bit a little bit more advanced than what you're used to so this vertical and this horizontal approach have a plan on how you're going to do this i personally chose the vertical approach and now at this point i'm doing i'm starting my security okay and that security will be uh, not necessarily in cisco but still if i was going to do the cisco method it'd be ccna security and ccmp uh security so i love this vertical approach when i do my tracks i don't like the horizontal approach but again this is all what is up to you i mean this is your preference this is something that you need to decide okay now on that note or i should say that's pretty much it with that note let's let's move on to the next thing and the next thing will be labs okay um when you're drawing out your labs it's very important that as a ccna that you're going to do your own labs you can go out and buy CCNA labs, but I'm telling you, it's best to draw them out. It's best to write them out. So if I had two routers, and let's say I had router one and router two. Now, depending on what I purchased with my router, let's say I got a 2600 router, okay, that had two fast ethernets, connections and that's it let's say that it does that i did not buy any WIC cards okay i did not buy any so from here if i have two routers that's fine i can actually hook one router up to here or one interface from this interface this would be fa00 this would be fa00 and if i wanted to add another router in here let's say router three because we're going to assume that you're not going to have more than three routers. And from here, I can come from FA01 to FA01. Okay? And then from here, I can connect these two devices like this. This would be FA01, and this would be FA00. So I was able to make this type of topology with just three cables fat you know three straight through cables and two and three routers now when you buy your routers make sure that you're buying routers with two fast ethernets don't buy one with just one ethernet okay and based on the 2600s that you're going to purchase it makes a difference so just pay attention when you're buying those now let's say i wanted to do a different type of setup here Where ideally, when we have our routers, ideally our fast Ethernet is going to connect into a switch. So let's say this is fast zero zero. Here's another switch over here. And this will plug into FA00. And from here, we can connect these two devices like so, FA01, FA01. Now, the connection between the routers will be simulating as if this was building one and this was building two. Now, how far your buildings are doesn't really matter, okay? They can be miles away. But remember, you're just doing a lab. So remember, when you're building this, you're going to have different IP address schemes, you're going to be building these out 
and then let's say this is a 192.168.1.0 network this is a 192.168.2.0 network and this is the 192.168.3.0 network okay so pretty nice all right let's think of another way of building a lab environment we'll go ahead and erase all this here's router one here's router two here's a switch here here's another switch okay this will be switch one this will be switch two now whenever you're doing this you always write out your interfaces because this gives you the ability to pl uh, plug your cables in now this doesn't matter whether you're doing GNS3 really or doing your uh, real equipment again I'm a fan of real equipment and GNS3 you can't limit you can't do switches anyway uh, they have a switch module in there uh, but those switches are just just hubs so you're not really getting the switch command line or the switch ability to be able to separate traffic yes you can put them in different VLANs but all they're doing is separating those uh, that traffic and just separate uh, hub type broadcast domain so it's it, it's nothing nothing major all right and here this way with your switches your real switches and your real routers you can practice track you know you know putting this in one vlan putting this in another vlan putting this in a vlan you can actually make this into a trunk link which will be able to carry the vlan traffic across if you want to do it that way this can be in a different vlan all right and you'll be able to practice how the vlan traffic is handled from switch to switch or just across a switch plane it doesn't really matter Okay, now here you can actually have this router sitting up here. This could be router three. And you could plug into here, and you could plug into here. This would be FA00. This would be FA01. This would be FA01. And this would be FA01. So, nice lab, isn't it? Now we do have a third switch down here. You could actually set up a third switch if you want. Now remember what I told you, it's best to have four switches to learn spanning tree. However, and I've said this plenty of times, your exam is only going to test you most likely on three switches. The only reason why I want you to get four switches is so you could have a better a better understanding of spanning tree. Because remember, my ultimate goal, yes, is for you to pass the exam, but it really is to understand the technology. That is really the ultimate goal. And that's why I want you to have four switches. It gives you a better understanding of how Spanitry really works. However, if you have three switches, trust me, that's better than nothing. It's a lot better than two. Okay? So you could hook up your devices like this. If you wanted to, we can move this around. Let's get rid of all this. And we can have another router sitting over here. Router three. Okay, and that could plug into there. All right, so this is different ways of setting up your your routers and your switches. Just simple labs. Now, keep in mind that this is just with fast Ethernet. Each one of these has two fast Ethernet uh, uh, connect uh, ports on these routers. What if you had serial links? See, from here, if I actually have my WIC one T cards. WIC 1T or WIC 2T, doesn't matter, or 2T, then I would have more interfaces. Now, you have to ask yourself this. Well, okay, well, why would I want more interfaces? Well, if I plug this device up like so, this will be Fast Ethernet 011, or 01. This will be Fast Ethernet 01. Okay, and that's it. I'm out of interfaces. But if I had a WIC 1T card in this one and this one, that's great because now I can have this serial connection going from router 2 to router 3. 
If I want it, I can also have a serial connection going over to router one and router two. I'm sorry, router one and router three. Starting to see the beauty of this? So remember, technically, you don't have to get the one T cards. I know in the previous video I said you, you know, uh, you would definitely need to get white Rick one T cards because it gives you more options. It gives you more flexibility to be able to create more labs and and, and more I, I guess you could say uh the best way of explaining it would be more somewhat complicated labs because remember you're only dealing with three routers and three switches um the more you're dealing with this the better as far as links are concerned because really let's say you have a a route sitting over here which is three that three that three that three okay remember when we're dealing with routing protocols router three is going to advertise its routing protocol or i should say router three is going to advertise this route which which direction is he going to advertise the route that's a good question he's going to send that route in this direction and in this direction so because of that, that means that route, that routing information is going to go up here, go up through here, and then router two is going to get this information in on fast Ethernet zero zero. He's also going to get it on this interface, which will be, uh, let's go back to red here, and we'll say this is zero one one, and this is serial one one. He's going to get it on the serial one one interface. That traffic is also going to come up through here. FAO1 is going to get it on its fast Ethernet 00, and then he's going to send it over to Router 2. So now Router 2 has three ways to get to this route, and now you get to be able to see the cool things that happens with your routing protocols. You know, what if there are different types of metrics? How are they going to be put into the routing table? What if they're all the same metric? Hmm. Will I be able to have three routes for the or three, yeah, three entries in my routing table for a, for the same route? Is that possible? Okay, and this is what makes you understand, and this is why having multiple cables is really nice to have. Very nice to have. So let's say I had another serial cable in here. Let's say I had two of them in here. That gives me the ability to have another serial cable here. And another serial cable here and we got this serial connection going through here and now that means that this route for router 2 is going to be learning even another path because that's going to be sent router 1 is going to send it through here as well wow now i got four interfaces now what if i can make four entries in the routing table and i can actually do a particular command that lets me see the traffic go out all the interfaces That'll be awesome. What if I sent out like a ICMP traffic and I wanted to just do a simple ping and I do a simple trace route and I say that I want to send four packets per trace route. Now, you might not know what any of this stuff is because you're starting to get into CCNA, no big deal. But when you run this, you will see one packet go this way, you will see one packet go this way, one packet go out this way, and one packet go out this way. And this is a concept of load sharing or load balancing however you want to say it there is a difference but some people still just say load balancing even though it's load sharing and vice versa so um technically you can use interchangeably all right so just this just having these extra cables just makes things a lot easier however you are a CCNA candidate. So this means that if you can't afford these things, guys, let's really look at the whole scenario. Bare minimum. Bare minimum, this is what I want you to get. Three routers, okay? I need you to get three of them. Now, the model numbers of these routers can be 2500s, 2600s, but now remember, okay, these come with serial interfaces. They don't come to 2500s and they don't come with fast Ethernet. They come with just Ethernet. All right? And technically, you would have to get a transceiver in order to get that Ethernet. 
So you might want to stay away from the 2500s. Yes, they are cheaper. If you want to go that way, that's just fine. Okay, this will give you uh, two serial interfaces, and this will give you one uh, Ethernet, but only if you buy a transceiver. And those transceivers, uh, they could be expensive. I'm sure I'm spelling receiver here wrong, but either way, okay? You would need a transceiver here. I'm sorry, I'm sure that's wrong, but oh well. All right, your 2600s, you can get them with either one fast Ethernet or two fast Ethernets. Please get the one with two fast Ethernet ports, okay? And then from there, if that's all you want, that's fine. Your, op your option will also be able to get uh, two WIC 1T cards or two WIC two T cards. Now if you get the two with two T cards, okay, that would give you four interfaces extra on your router, but you gotta buy the WIC two T cables. Alright? Now you can also get uh for your CCNA you can get um the twenty six hundred XMs. Now, the nice thing about the XMs is you can use this even for your CCMP. All right. Obviously, you want two fast Ethernets, and this will take you all the way up to your CCMP. All right. CCIE, you know, that's something you do your own research on. Let's just let's just stick with CCNA and CCMP for the time being. All right. You also have twenty eight hundreds. You also have 3725s. And you also have 1921s. Now, these are just numbers. I mean, you can go and look at the actual models that you want. You can look them up in eBay. Now, what makes one model different than the other? Okay? Speed. Really. All right. When you go out and you spend more money for a router, and remember, guys, you're going on eBay and you're buying this equipment. If you went to go buy Juniper equipment, it probably cost you two hundred dollars plus. Where these routers here with Cisco, you can get them for fifty bucks in some aspects. The reason why is because it's so abundant. What happens is a company goes out, they decide that they want to actually upgrade. So what they do, they take all the equipment out, they put it on a pallet, and they sell it to some guy. Some guy takes it back to his warehouse and he puts it on eBay stating that all the equipment works. And guys, it, it you know, you might have issues with some of your equipment. You know, I, I do not a lot, but nothing really major. You know, I could put a WIC, uh, WIC 1T card into a router. All of a sudden, my router won't boot. It just keeps looping. It never comes to a command prompt. I take that WIC T card out, put it in another router, it works just fine. Put that WIC T back in that same router that was giving me issues, it still wouldn't boot. So, um, you know, switch things around if you start getting issues. So what's the difference between these routers? Speed. How many packets per second it can, uh, it can actually move traffic? How fast it can move traffic? How fast it can process traffic? And some, you know, other different type of features. You're labbing. You don't need speed. Okay? <laughs> You're labbing. So, again, if you want 2800s, I got 2800s in my lab. I started off with 2500s. Then I end up buying some 2600s. Then I end up buying some 26XMs. Then I end up buying some 3725s. Then I end up buying some 2800s. And then I bought some 1921s. So, yeah, I got lots of equipment. However, I'm not suggesting you do the same thing. You need three routers, okay? If you want to prep, thinking you're going to the CCMP, that's fine. All right, I choked. I chose the cheapest route. I got to 2500s when I was doing it. I said that's all I need. It worked great, and that was it. You know, when I got to my CCMP, I was in school at that time, and they had Cisco equipment, so I used their 2800 routers. All right, so keep in mind that you're trying to get to the studies. 
don't spend so much time trying to find out what router works the best for your situation. Guys, listen to me. The iOS might be a little different from 2500 to 2600, but what's really different? The features. Are you going to spend the time to go out there and do this and look for what the features are and what's the difference is? Sure, why not? However, if you're doing a CCNA, the 2500, the 2600, the 2600 XMs, the 2800s, the 20, uh, 37, 25s, and the 1920s, everything's fine. All these work up to your CCMP. Only thing I recommend is not used is is with the CCMP to start here. That's the only thing I recommend with the 2600 XMs because you might find some features that you won't be able to lab and it's a recommendation do your own research alright so keep in mind that even your 1921s this 1921 is more expensive than all these routers alright so the chances of you getting this should be slim alright you should be thinking along the lines of really to be honest with you, the 2600 XMs is really what's probably best for you starting off. If you can only afford the 2600s, that's fine. Just make sure to get two fast Ethernets. If you can only afford the 2500s, so be it. Okay? Don't feel like you're selling yourself short. You're not. You got real equipment sitting in front of you, and trust me, that alone is golden. So let's take a look at your switches. Uh, just for this, we're going to say three switches. You know, I want you to have four, but three switches is all you need. Okay? 1900s. Absolutely, absolutely no. Do not purchase 1900s. I said that previous in my course. All right? We got the 2950s. This is most likely going to be the switch for you. Now... ISL is is pretty much going bye bye. It might be in your in, in in the actual current CCNA. It might not. So some of the twenty nine hundreds do not have ISL capable. So you won't be able to run like a command encapsulation dot one Q because it only runs dot one Q. So there's no point of having a command that say encapsulation dot one Q when it's when all it handles is dot one Q. All right, so if you ever run across that with a switch, no big deal. All right, so your 2950s are great. The 3500 XLs, I mean, you might end up, you might end up spending more money than what they're worth, and you're probably better off going with the 2950s. And then you got the 3550s and the 3560s. Now, what's the difference between the 2500? and 3500 XLs and these two. These are layer two only. You can't do any routing with these. Now as a CCNA, you might be coming around with routing on your on your switches. This is something that you have to figure out if you want to do this. Now the 3550s uses more electricity and they're bigger. The 3560s are a lot smaller, a lot lighter too, because the 3550s are heavy. And these are layer 3 switches, which means you can do routing with these switches. You can turn every port into a routed port. And you can actually do SVIs. Okay? Which is actually having an interface for your layer 2. Alright? So, if you had a 2900. And you had a switch sitting in here. And this was in VLAN 10. And this one was in VLAN 20, you would literally, if this was a 2950, a layer two switch, you would literally have to have a router to be able to route between, or to communicate between uh, VLAN 10 and VLAN 20. That's your big difference. If you had a 3550 or 3560, this would be a layer three switch, and you would not need a router because the layer three would be a router. And you can and you can communicate between these VLANs with just the switch. All right, there's your big difference. All right, so let's go ahead and build ourselves a lab here. 
Here's router one, router two, and router three. And we're gonna just switch colors here. All right, so we're gonna say this is a 2950. You got 13560 and another 2950. So I'm just kind of mixing it up here. And up here, you got yourself a, um, we'll say a 2500, and we got ourselves a 2600 and a 2600 XL. All right? Guys, it doesn't matter. You see my point? As long as you get the routing concepts down. Okay? At 2500 routes traffic just like a 2600. The only difference is you're limited with the 2500. So 2500 has the serial interfaces embedded into the router. And the 2600s, you can actually add modules. So let's go take a look at that. All right, and you saw how simple it was for me to build up that lab. This is all based on what you want to spend. Okay, so I'm going to say Cisco 2500. I know it's not on the screen, but it's coming up here shortly. Okay, and we'll go to images here. All right, and here's a 2500, and it's a nice size picture, so let's bring it up. This is a 2500, guys. All right. 2500 you get two embedded serial cables so that means that gives you two interfaces all right and this interface here this AUI port is what's going to be used as a ethernet cable and we're going to go up here and we're going to say transceiver uh we're going to say AUI transceiver and there they are. That's what they look like. Okay? It's it's poor resolution, so it's, it's no point of actually... Uh, this is a decent one. Alright, and that's it. On the one side over here, it plugs in to your AUI port, and that gives you an Ethernet port. Not fast Ethernet, but Ethernet. And that, you can only have one. Alright? So if you got three... 2500 routers you will only be getting three interfaces on each because remember guys it's all about the interfaces now another reason why you want serial interfaces the main reason you want serial interfaces because i know what some of you are thinking well why don't i just save money and just not get the serial interfaces i mean why not well there's a concept called frame relay okay and you can't do frame relay on fast ethernet it has to be on a serial interface so if you want to learn and study that topic you're going to have to get yourself some big 1t cards and some um, big 1t cables okay so now let's take a look at our 2600 routers and we're gonna come up here and we are going to say router all right so let's actually do a search here and we want to say size and we'll say longer larger than good 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 and let's take a look at this picture right here this looks pretty good Okay, now as you can see, this one right here only has one fast Ethernet. Okay, 10 100 megabits per second, fast Ethernet 00, zero and that's it. Trust me, I've made mistakes just buying them because they were a great deal, not realizing there was only one. Look at the model number. This is a 2610 XM. So whether you get the 2600s or the XM models, you could be getting one serial interface. All right, so pay attention to that. So let's come down to this one. Let's see what this is. All right, this is a 26, I believe that's a 2621 here, which it is. Uh, you can barely see it because of the screw here. And notice we have two fast ethernets, 
1 and 2. Okay? See these modules? This is where you will stick your WIC 1T cards. Right in here. You will screw, take the screw out and stick it right in there. All right? What they have in there now is a T1 card. You also have this module over here where you can add certain things. Let's show you what I have in one of my uh, one of my routers here. Okay? We're going to say 20 uh, Cisco uh, serial module. Here we go. Okay? This is this this is one of them. All right? See how see how big it is? It will fit in that huge slot that I was showing you on the left-hand side, and this will give you four extra serial cables. Okay? And if you wanted to build yourself a frame relay switch and you wanted lots of interfaces, the ones that I have, I have lots of these, by the way, and it's actually, and each one of my routers has these in there, and they're not four of these, it's actually eight of them. So all, both rows will have four of these serial cables in there. So that's why a lot of people love the 2600s, because it gives you flexibility to put things in there. Okay, here's the WIC 1T card that I was talking about that goes in those small module slots. Here's the WIC 2T cards that I was talking about. Uh, not really a great, uh, great picture here. Let's actually scroll back up here because I saw one up here. Here it is. All right, here's a WIC, 1T, uh, WIC 2T card. Notice that it has two of them in, in there. So if I had WIC 1T and only had two slots, I would have be able to get two serial connections. If I had WIC 2T cards, I could put one in each slot and that would give me four serial cables. This is all up to you how many interfaces you want. Um, if you go by the logic of more is better, that's not always the case. You know, but it more does give you more flexibility. You can build out your labs a lot of different ways. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at the 2800s. As you can see, the 26 and the 26XMs are the same. The only difference is going to give you some is, is different types of features that you might need in the CCMP. So just keep that in mind. All right. So let's look at the front. I want to look. Here we go. This is what I want to see. Okay, so here, notice this 2800, I have four modules. So I could put four WIC 1Ts in there or four WIC 2Ts, which will give me eight interfaces. Then I could put another eight module in here, which will give me 16 serial interfaces if that's what I wanted to do. Do you need that many? No, you really don't, especially for your CCNA. You know, and that's why the 2800s, they're more expensive. So you might not want to go that route. All right, so just keep that in mind. So what we're going to do is we're going to price this out because when I was doing my previous video now, today, the date of today, all right, because when you look at my previous videos, you can see the date on there because I had my time at the bottom. The date of today is 6-15-15. Okay, and here we'll be able to see some prices. So we're going to go out, and this is what I'm going to go out, and this is what I'm going to build. And then we're right on the screen here. I'm going to get me three, uh, I'm going to say 2600 XM routers. That's what I'm going to go look for right now. And let's go find out what the cost is. And we're going shopping. All right, we're going to bring this down just a little bit. And we'll say um, Cisco 2600 XMs. Now, just because I'm choosing these routers doesn't mean these are the ones that, that you need to be getting. All right, this is your choice. So I'm going to go to buy it now which is what I love to do and I'm gonna say go to the lowest first okay and I'm gonna scroll down until I start seeing routers and the first thing I'm really gonna do though is come over down here and change this item here on eBay to 200 and now I get to scroll down here until I start seeing equipment 
Oh, hey, check this out. Here's some of those modules I was talking about. Here's the fours and here's the eights. They're twenty five dollars a piece. Mine, they were more expensive when I bought mine. But you know, here you could just grab this twenty five dollar, add it in. Look, it tells you right here. These are for the twenty six hundreds, the tens, the twenties, the twenty ones, the twenty twenty six fifties, and the twenty six hundred XMs and the thirty six hundred routers. All right, so they'll work. Fantastic, and they do work. It's great. You just plug them in. Don't plug them in while the router is on, and you'll be good to go. All right, because I have destroyed one of my slots by doing that. All right, you got memory here if you need to add memory. Nine times out of ten, you don't need to add memory uh, unless you are uh, changing the iOS. Normally, the iOS that comes on it is fine with your CCNA. All right, now, anytime I see a router sitting here around memory and components, be very careful with that because it might be just for parts. So you definitely want to read that. And we're looking for making sure that this bad boy works. Cisco router. Does not uh, open the case. So it seems like this is a working device. It doesn't really say it is. Let's see what this says up here. Item has been tested and is fully functional. And they have more than 10. So right here, I can get three routers, free shipping, $60 each. Let's get our truck seat calculator. We know it's $180, but we're going to do it anyway. All right, 60 times three is $180. So let's get here and write this up here. $180 is my price for my three, my three routers. Right off the bat, I ordered from the same guy, and we're good. All right, so now we're going to order three switches. And I'm just going to get for, well, we'll say we're going to do it for the, the 3560s. We'll have the 3560s priced here, and we'll also do the 2950s. How about that? 3560s, if you want to get to the CCMP level and you just want to buy them now, uh, 30, uh, 2950s if you're really, really, really budgeted. Okay? And there's nothing wrong with being budgeted, guys. You're just trying to learn. You're trying to start a new career. So there's nothing wrong with that. So we're going to say Cisco uh, 3560s. Okay? And we're going to go to Buy It Now. And Blow First. Okay, let's scroll down. Oh, uh, we already, wow, passed them pretty quick. Only one left. I like to get my, all mine from the same guy. Wow, they've really dropped their prices. Guys, when I bought my 3560s, they were uh, $200 a piece. Originally, when I started my CCNA, they were $1,000 a piece. Crazy how they've dropped. Okay, so the unit is good overall condition. Uh, he only has one. So let's go find someone else. Uh, this is 75. He only has one. A lot of these people only have one, which is kind of... It's kind of weird. Make sure I'm not uh, clicking on the same things here. All right. We'll find one eventually. Wow. It looks like it looks like the same guy is having different ads just for one, which is kind of weird. I'm not seeing one that has multiple buyers. Look at that. I've I've never ran across that. And that's you know this is all from the same guy. Why they're only doing one at a time instead of saying I have ten available is beyond me. Um we're gonna say this is seventy five dollars. Because we're looking for the average. $75 plus 14 for shipping. So you're looking for 90 bucks. Times that by three. That gives you 200 and or 300 bucks. So that would be 300 bucks for this. All right. 
Now, let's go ahead and take a look at the 2950s. I'm spending the time doing this so you would know what to do, how to go out and get this information and go out there and buy your equipment. All right, so we're going to say Cisco 2950s. Okay, so we're at, we're going to do buy it now. Don't want to do auctions. Don't have time for auctions. And we're going to say price, shipping, and handling lowest first. All right, and right off the bat, let's see, we got a 29.50. Up, oh, it says four parts. Be careful with that. See that? Oh uh, wow, I I can't believe what I'm looking at here. These prices is crazy, 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 crazy. All right, four parts or not working. So be careful with that. That's probably why they're priced this way. Four parts. Okay, so just be careful. All right, so it's used, but it's only one. So we're going to try to find an average. Here we go. This guy has two available. Let's see if we can find one that has more than two available. This guy has eight available. All right, so we have $15 shipping plus our $10. This is crazy. Let's go back and make sure I'm looking at this correct. $10, 15 shipping. Okay, let's let's drop down here a little bit more. Um, like this one here. This is $20. And, of course, you got to calculate the shipping. They didn't give me a shipping price, so let's not use that one. Uh, let's look at this one. Uh, guys, I'm just trying to make it more expensive. All right, this one has full available. Uh, shipping and handling. Uh, is telling me to calculate. We don't want to do that. Still calculate. Let's come back down to here. We'll get there. All right, so here we go. Shipping and handling, 18 plus 10. So we'll say they're $30 each. So on an average, we'll say they're $30 each. So you're 29 50s will cost you 90 bucks. So if you decided to go to 2950 route, okay, this right here will be $270 just for your lab. Just for your lab. All right, and you can go cheaper with these routers if you want to. If money is really a big issue. Now, what else do we need? If Remember, you want your routers to have two interfaces. If you're not going to get the one, week one T cards, that's fine. Um, I definitely think about adding it to your lab. But if you're not going to, that's fine. You will not be able to do frame relay without it. So just keep that in mind. But let's say you had to buy the week one T cards. You have three routers. So that means you're going to need six week one T's. Okay. Now, let's take a look at what those week one T's cost. Buy it now, and we'll say goes to, and apparently they've gotten rid. Oh, that's that's not what we're looking for. Here we go. All right. So hey, even give you a one year warranty. <laughs> I mean that's great. All right. He has ten available. So right there, six of those times seven is forty five bucks. Okay. So here we're gonna put our. We're gonna erase this because that I mean ninety bucks is too you know too nice to pass up. Just too nice. And I'm making that decision. I mean you could definitely make a different decision. To me, ninety bucks for three switches to start my CCNA, it's too is it's compared to three hundred, it it's it's a big difference. It's too easy to pass up. Alright? And our next one's going to be six WIC 1T cards. And that's going to equal, uh, we'll say, 45 bucks. All right, so our 45 bucks for that. And cabling can be pretty cheap. All right. Um, 
we're gonna need our we can draw this out just whenever you get confused we can draw them out and say okay let's say router one router two router three if i have two weak t cards in here that means i'm gonna go to here to here and ah, that's kind of bad let's let's redraw that i'll do it this way all right and then we have a serial connection there so that's going to give us an s we'll say s1 uh zero this would be s one zero this would be s one one this would be s one zero and this would be s one one so right there that tells me that for my six cables on my six wick t cards i'm gonna need three cables right there see draw it out write it out it'll all make sense to you okay so now i'm gonna need three and they're called DCE slash DTE cables. All right, so just in case you're confused, that's why we're going through all this. All right, we're going to shorten this down even more, come all the way up. And we're going to say Cisco DCE DTE. That's all we're going to do. Let's type that out, okay? Now, remember these, look at these. These are for your WIC 2Ts. It's a different type of cable. We're doing WIC 1Ts. All right. So we go to buy it now, which are already in there. Oh, we're good. We're good to go. Here we go. Right here. This is what they look like. They, they This is what they are as well, but they're wrapped up in plastic. This is what they look like. All right. And so he has 10 available. They're $8 a piece, free shipping. Okay. And let's take a look at this picture here. And this is what they look like. Now, these are very, 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 very short. Not a big deal if your routers are right next to each other. Not a big deal at all. Okay? See? And that's how they plug in. Perfect picture. Let's kind of make this a little bit bigger here. There you go. All right, so perfect picture. So not a big deal if they're sitting right next to each other. If you want longer cables, that's fine. But these are really short. If you want longer ones, you can get three feet ones. That's the ones I usually get. I usually get the ones that are three feet long. I don't like them that short. Okay? So we're looking at $7 or $8 a piece. So that gives us another $25 for our cables, for our DC cables. $25. Okay? And what's left? Well, your router should be coming with power cords, okay? You're also going to need one uh, USB to serial. Let's go price that out. And we're just going to use a Belkin. Uh, the reason why I like using the Belkin, because I know they work, uh, the really cheap one, guys, don't do it. Don't get the really cheap ones. And, they're, and the really cheap ones are like green. <laughs> and I'm telling you, uh, like they're really small. They're really short. You have all types of problems with those. So just spend the money to get a better one. And if this one is $10, you can't beat that. So let's go to... Because I spent $30 plus on mine. So here it is. $10 buy it now he has three available you can get one of them just for 10 bucks let's say by the time you see this video look you're probably looking at about 20 bucks i spent 30 for mine so that's about the average so we'll just say 20 bucks 20 dollars all right you're going to need a console cable a lot of times you get your routers off eBay, they're going to give you a console cable with it. But just in case, just in case, Cisco console cable. All right, you're looking at a dollar here. <laughs> I mean, guys, these things are so abundant. I, I got so many of them because of all the routers I bought. I They kept giving them to me. So we'll just say $3 for this cable.
Uh, no, we only need one of these. One uh, console cable. Console cable. And this will be uh, $3. All right. So you got your USB to serial. You got your console cable. This allows you to plug into your devices. All right, you got your three rounders, you got your three switches, you got your DCE, DT, uh, DTE cables, you got uh, you got your WIC 1T devices. All right, and the only thing we're missing now is fast Ethernet cables. Now again, you need to decide how many cables you want to have. All right. Now keep in mind that you're going to need two types. You're going to need straight. And crossovers. Now, when you're connecting your switches together, you're going to be using crossover cables. Okay? These are going to be crossover cables. When you're going from a router to a switch, this is going to be a straight through cable. All right. So if you're wondering what the difference is, you'll find out later on. But just keep in mind, you're going to need a crossover cable between the switches. Now, this is for the 2900s, the 2950s. If you get, if you get the 3560s, all right, you can just use straight through cables because 3560 has the auto MDXI or whatever it's called, M MDX, whatever. All right, it has that on these interfaces. And because of that, you will not have to use crossover cables. But if you're getting just all 2950s, you're going to need crossover cables between them. Just to be safe, Anytime you're connecting switches, uh, a switch to switch, no matter what the model is, just use a crossover cable. Okay? So now you have these three devices, these three routers, and these three switches. And this is how I like to do it. I like to think of it as worst case scenario. I like to say I'm going to connect this to here, to here. Okay, and maybe I will connect this one over to here and this one over to here and maybe this one down to here. Okay, so notice I'm using all of these and then from here I'm going to connect my switch to here to here and I'm going to come back up to here and maybe I want to connect it twice. Uh, I'm sorry, let's do this. Sorry, that's not what I wanted to do. And maybe I wanted to actually have this one. Um, over here and this one um, actually I don't want to do this I want to do two of these each so you got one two and then one and two and if we draw them out like this in this case we get confused here We can say one, two, and that can go here and here if we want to do it that way, and then two and two. Okay? So if you wanted to do it that way, that means that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And we'll say twelve cables all together. However, if I'm going to use crossover cables, that's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six and six. So six straight through cables and six crossover cables. This is how I built my lab. So we can get rid of all this now. And I'm drawing this out so because when you do yours, this is what you should be doing. You're watching me doing it. I'm doing all the work for you. But if you want to do it again, if you forget, hopefully it'll be in the back of your mind. All you have to do is just draw it out. That's the best way to do it. So now I'm going to find some straight through cables. Three feet is fine. I mean, that's all you need. So we'll say uh, cat five, three foot, uh, three feet. And we 
come down and said buy it now and Lois first okay now keep in mind don't buy cables from China guys it's nothing wrong with China it's just getting things from China takes a long time okay so try to come down here and say look US only it's gonna be a little bit more expensive but trust me you don't want to wait forever all right now uh, you can actually do the miles if you want to but nonetheless uh, let's look at here these are three foot cables all right and they got five available but we need six each and try to look for cables that look pretty decent I don't really like these type because they're very difficult to unplug these are the ones I like and trust me if you're gonna be unplugging and plugging them in these are the type of cables you want see it has that little lip you can either push that little lip underneath the plastic piece that stops the cable from coming out or you accidentally uh, pushing on it and plugging it out but it makes it very easy to actually un undo if you use these cables here these cables are man they're a pain in the butt you got to put a lot of pressure on getting these out and if you're constantly want to switch cables back and forth trust me you're gonna have very very sore thumbs about it by the end of the day so I like to buy these cables here these are the ones that I like and I usually get the blue ones but blue or black it doesn't really matter all right and notice they got way more than 10 they usually do they're three dollars a piece you need six of these and that's going to give you eighteen dollars so twenty dollars for this and let's go take a look at the crossover cables and we're gonna say three feet crossover again we're gonna come down and try to find better cables like these notice they're a little bit more expensive okay and make sure we are on buy it now uh, crossover cables are a little more expensive. Uh, you can let's take a look at these. It doesn't give me the option to maximize this. Um, yeah, that could be kind of expensive. I mean, you're talking about thirty dollars just for cables. If you go to cheap route, uh, let's make sure we're US only, which we are still you can go to cheap route um, just keep in mind you want f again this picture could be misleading you could be getting one of these and again that will kinda that will kinda suck usually with the switches you might be able to plug them in and leave them there for out your entire CCNA lab all depends but that's usually not the case you're going to be switching cables around a lot so you definitely don't want these where you have to push down really hard on them so I'm we're just going to say Look, they're eleven dollars. We're gonna say they're thirty dollars, thirty-three dollars, or thirty-five bucks. We'll just do it that way. All right. So this is twenty, and this is thirty-five. All right. Now, guys, that completes our lab. Now, again, power cables come with your device. Uh, if they don't, uh, let's say they don't. Let's say they do not come. And we'll just say Cisco. Uh, what did we get? We got the 2600 power cables. Okay, there you go. Red Byte now, lowest first. Let's see how many he has. I'm sure he has tons of them. There you go. Uh, this is eight. This is $8 plus our $4 shipping. So we're looking at $12. All right, so we'll just say twelve dollars plus our, and this is going to be the same cables for the switches too. Um, actually, that does not look like the proper cable here. And I can see all these have power cables. Most of them do. If you want to make sure they have power cables with them, just just send someone, you know, send the person an email. All right, we'll just say Cisco power cables. All right, there we go. Even cheaper. We're out of box. Here we go. Here's another one. 
Uh, that's the wrong ones. These are the ones you want. Don't get the ones with the side cables or the, or the, or the ones aside. Don't get these either. Those are not correct. What you want is the plug on one side and this type on the other. So this is the one I'm going to look at. Let's see how many he has. He has more than 10. Notice that plug. That three-way plug is what you're looking for. Okay? This prong, incorrect. So you got you know you want a regular plug. So you got to be very careful when you plug when you're putting this in because these are for you to hook things up into cable racks and things like that, like in the data center or in the com room. So you got to be careful with that. All right. So I'm trying to find just a regular uh, power cable. Um, you can actually do this and just say PC power cable. Okay, and there we go. That's all we need. Regular PC power cable. Got the three prongs and plugged into your wall. All right, and these are about uh, $5 a piece. Shipping and handling. You're going to need six of them, so that's what? $15. Again, the chances of you having to buy these are very slim. Alright, let's recheck that because I kind of forgot already just that quick. Alright, so it's $5 free shipping. So $5 plus uh, 6 is $30. I don't know why I said 15 So we need 6 power cables. And that would be um, 30 bucks. So, let's do our Let's add it all up. Twenty plus thirteen, starting on the left, plus twenty, plus thirty five, plus thirty, plus one eighty, plus ninety, plus forty five, plus twenty five. And there's our CCNA lab, four hundred and fifty bucks. Okay? Now let's knock some things off here. Let's say that um, I got my, the, the power cables came with them. So we'll go ahead and scratch off the power cables. Boom. All right. Um, let's say I didn't get crossover cables. Again, if you get the 2950s, which kind of dropped us off a big time with the price, we're going to need them. So that might not be something that we can cross off. All right. Let's say I don't need the console cables because every you know, every router I bought came with a console cable. All right. So I don't need the console cable. Let's say with the WIC 1T cards, let's say that I decided to... Let's see. Let's bring up a... Actually, no. Let's, let's just clear this off here. It was 458. We'll actually write that up here. 458 was our first price. Let's say that I am not going to get the uh six week one T cars. Let's say I'm just gonna get three for right now. Okay? So that so that knocks us in half, right? So take the forty five divided by two, one, two uh, two, five, and that is, um, <laughs> I can't believe I'm drawing a blank here, uh, seven, nine, actually, actually, no, 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 sorry, I was gonna say that addition isn't right, so that's, f that's two, so that's four, five, and that's two, four, one point five. Twenty-two. 45 2250 okay so just by me dropping this down I dropped that down in half and that's going to give me three WIC 1T cards so now I'm getting three all right and this is, is pretty much what it is let's say I wanted to go with the 2600s instead so I come over to here and let's take a look at the 2600s OK, 
Okay, let's scroll down until we start seeing these bad boys. Wow. Wow, I actually got to go to the second page. All right, let's scroll down some more. Let's see if we actually pick some of these up. Scrolling a lot faster this time. Oh, here we go. Finally got some here. Um, they're mixed with a bunch of memory, so I'm going to assume that they are no good. So we're going to keep on scrolling down until we start seeing a chain of routers, and here we go. All right, so this guy has 26 hundreds. Now, remember, we want the one with the two interfaces. So we might want to get a little bit more specific. So here's a 2600. And we look on the back of here, and it only has one serial port. Okay? See that? Only one. So let's scroll back up here and get a little bit more specific by saying 2621. Okay? Because that's going to give us our two interfaces. So we're going to scroll down here until we start seeing some routers here. Here we go. All right, so here we got some up here, and yeah, we went a little too far, but that's fine. All right, and let's take a look at this. This is $40. He only has one, so let's scroll down some more. This guy wants $45. Yeah, I hate you know I hate when they put up multiple ads like that and yeah he only has two available. I like doing it this way. I I don't like buying them like this because these people are usually selling a whole a whole rack here. Um, let's find out what they're doing. Say that they're trying to sell. It looks like they're only selling one because they definitely will have more than just. That's sitting there. I know it's a little time consuming, but we'll get through it. And see, you might have to end up buying these piece by piece because it's really going up in price here. So let's say it's 60, um, 60 bucks on average. Because even these, like 30, 20, 35, they still charge me $20 shipping. So still 60 bucks for the 26, 21s. Um, and then the XMs were the same thing. So we, we can't get them less than 2600 Unless we go to the 2500s, which kind of, we kind of don't really want to go that low. Um, I personally don't. Not for this exercise anyway. So now let's actually do our math here. So we've got 20 plus 20 plus 35 plus 180 uh, plus 90 plus 2250 plus 20. Let's try it again. 20 plus 20 plus 35 plus 180 plus 90 plus 2250 plus 25 and we're under we're on the 400 bucks and see that and then later on when you want to get to your lab or I should say if you want to add on to your lab you can buy WIC 1T cards and do it that way and and go and go that route Okay, so we did kind of two labs here. Uh, one we decked it out completely. Uh, the other one, we're assuming that we're getting the power cables, we're getting the console cables, and you don't need one console cable. And again, with my CCNA, you got to understand, with my CCNA, you got to understand that each one of these devices, router one, router two, router three, and then our switches okay they all sat on my desk and every time I needed to take my PC here and I will plug my USB to serial so USB to serial I will plug that into here, okay, 
and we'll just make this into a kind of a serial connection here all right and then from there I will plug in my console cable like so and then from there I would plug into the back of my switch when I wanted to configure my switch I would then take it from there and I would plug it into here when I wanted to connect to my router and I had to come over to this router and then over to this router all right again when you're doing it as cheap as possible hey that's just that's just part of it you know I mean I have switched that console cable over a thousand times you know but eventually I end up getting an access server but again it can be kind of expensive and if you wanted to get an access server which means again here's your access server and you would not be using a USB to serial from there you would just be plugging in via a Ethernet cable fast Ethernet and to this device and then you'll have these octo cables that will plug in the back of each one of these consoles and technically they're all coming from the same module so I should be doing it in that fashion okay all right then you would literally log into this device and then access each one of these devices from your PC okay now if you decide that you want to use an access server and we got all this information so we can clear this off as well um actually no that's fine I'll just I'll just erase this And then we'll go over to here and we'll say Cisco Access Server. All right. Um, they're still expensive, man. All right. So let's go take a look at what these bad boys cost. Uh, we're going to say shipping lowing, lower first. And we're going to wait until we see some of these bad boys. Why are, oh they they dropped down a lot. Good. Let's see if we have a back. Mm, no, sorry guys. That's not a access server. Okay. Um you'll find out why here in a second. I thought that was extremely cheap for those. They shouldn't be as expensive that they are. But here, check this out. You could actually if you had a twenty six hundred, you could turn one of your router is into an access server all right the module will cost you seventy dollars but then you have to buy the oct octo cables which we're going to check those out as well all right and we're going to keep coming down i'm trying to think of the number i think it's a 25 21 or 21 20 25 51 here we go here's one right here 25 11 that's what they are okay so let's go ahead and click on this All right, we're going to hide this ink here. Uh, let's see if we can get a bigger picture here. There we go. This is what you're going to have in the back. These are your cables. It's an octo cable, which I'm going to show you now. All right. And they plug in the back of here. And when you plug into one of these slots, you have two slots here. You plug into one, it's going to be a nice connector that plugs in there. And on the other side of that connector, it's going to have eight cables, eight separate cables coming out. That's why they call it an octo table, you know, as an octagon. It's an octo ta uh, cable. And each one of those cables will plug into the console port of your device. All right very easy to use very easy to set up now um, let's see <sighs> Cisco octo cable there it is okay 25 bucks so if you go back you saw that this was $150 and that's cheap because I spent like 225 for mine when I got mine. So 150 bucks 
plus if you only have six devices you only need one octa cable so that would be 150 plus 25 so if you wanted to add an access server okay an access server will cost you an extra hundred and seventy five dollars all right and that will bring your lab if you use this method uh, it will bring you up to 475 and if you wanted to use this method which will be uh, 458 to 175 and that's 13 and that's 13 and that is 6 that would be six hundred and thirty three dollars so that access server can can drop you know can bring the price up drastically okay and this is what I want to discuss with you guys so I hope this was very helpful you is helpful with you as far as getting started but remember this is how you're going to get started the only other thing that you're going to need besides this equipment right here is two other things you're going to need and that's going to be your ICDN 1 and 2 books and any video training that you need all right now besides this besides this right here there's another thing you're going to need and we have to understand that we have to buy the exams I would strongly suggest that your lab fees are set aside okay so if each lab I see DM1 is equals uh, 150 that means the other one is going to equal 150 as well so 2 is going to equal 150 now please save enough for two exams please expect that you're going to fail on your first attempts with these labs alright I had to take ICD twice I had to take ICD in two twice some of these exams I've taken three times so that means just for this lab at hundred and fifty dollars a piece that's six hundred dollars just for your labs I mean just for you and that for your labs I'm sorry I said lab fee I'm sorry this is not right exam fees alright so that's six hundred dollars you should have set aside just for your exam fees so keep that in mind so as you can see six hundred dollars for your exams three hundred dollars for your lab it's going it's going you know you're running about a thousand dollars for your CCNA however this should not be scaring you off okay because you do not need to go out and spend a kick out a thousand dollars immediately all right keep that in mind if the average time is for you to spend on your CCNA is four to six months what does that tell you you got this time to save up to six hundred dollars now you might not have to have the six hundred dollars you might come up with the you know with the first exam four months later you might come up with the hundred and fifty bucks or maybe even have three hundred dollars saved up for the two exams and you you know you might find out that the first time you take it that you're going to be spending another month a month and a half of studying so that's going to give you some more time to save some money all right this was my total cost for my exam for the CCNA exam that's how much I spent all right and that was just for the exams and and the equipment okay the books that does not include the books and it does not include the video training all right but things are getting cheaper and cheaper when I did it it was a lot more expensive each one of the CCNA courses uh, or the CCNA course in a whole was a three hundred dollar course now you can you can go on you know places and, and find it a lot cheaper you know with me personally you know you can go to my website and get it for $25 you know per month it is a monthly fee 
and uh, we're going to cover that here right now. Okay. All right. Okay, it's videos.kyle-dungeon.com. Now, when you first come here, you got these intro videos. You can listen to them if you want. You scroll down here, and you got these three sections here. Okay, you got CCNA Free Beginnings, you got CCNA Full Course, and you got the Increase Your Income Up to Four Times. All right. At this point, that's all that's up there. But eventually, I will have some Linux courses up there and some uh, CCMP courses up there. I just haven't got that far yet. Uh, CCMP is very, very, very huge to create and it's very time consuming. So uh, that, along with work and trying to do my own studies with security, it, it just it, it's very, very difficult. But nonetheless, if you click on CCNA Beginnings. And then you come down here and say view all CCNA beginnings videos. This is the best way to do this. Because if you look at it from here and click on any one of these courses here, the problem is they're not in order just sitting here. They're randomly selected in there. I don't know why that is, but that's just the way it is. These courses, the CCNA course, the full course, is $25 a month subscription. With that, you would get this as well. Okay? The how to increase your income up to four times. If you go into CCNA Beginnings, come down here and click View All CCNA Free Beginning Videos. And I clicked it. It's just taking its sweet time. Now they're in order. Now, these are free for you to look at and view, okay? The first six chapters of my CCNA course is free to the public for anyone to come on this site and view them, okay? We go all the way down to chapter six. I, I don't know why Network Fundamentals is sitting right here. That's kind of weird. Uh, I might That might be my fault. I'll go check the playlist. Uh, and change that. But nonetheless, this will be your last one. Uh, the switch part six, I think it should be part one and two. Again, I will fix this. So that's not a big deal. But nonetheless, once you're done with chapter six, your free the free aspect, aspect of it is over. So come back to here. We're going to hit the backspace. We'll go to the CCNA full course and we'll say view all CCNA courses or full course videos. And right off the bat, it starts off with a pre CCNA getting started, the materials that you needed, things like that. Okay. Most likely, you know, most likely you might not need that since you're watching this course, but nonetheless. And notice that we start off with chapter seven. Okay, so you get to watch all the way up to port security, which is chapter six. And then after that, if you want to get chapter seven through tw uh, 20 plus, because there's over 20 chapters, then you will go to this description. All right. So if I click on one of these. Okay, it's going to play for me. So let's actually go back. Um, let's go ahead and close this out. We don't need this anymore. And let's go into a new uh, Cardinito thing here. And we'll say videos. And we'll come back down here and say CCNA full course. Okay, and then I'm just going to click on one of these videos.
Now, right here, it says create a new account. You're going to put your email in here. You're going to put your password in here. Okay, then you're going to click next. All right, and let me just put this in here. We'll just say Kyle uh, at gmail.com. And um, oh, fine, I'll just put a regular password in there so it can match. Okay, they should match. Okay, and it tells you this video is available under the full subscription for $24.95 per month. Would you like to subscribe? Click the subscribe button, and then you put your credit card information in there. Hit submit, and you're good to go. All right, and then you'll have access to them. All right, and it's all automated in the background. As long as you're paying for the prescription subscription, you'll be able to get your uh, the videos up there. Okay, and that's how you actually, if you want to use me as your CCNA source, here I am, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, speaking with everyone. Uh, once you are subscribed, I know that you have subscribed. I do monitor to see how your progressing is going, uh, and obviously, the more and more people that actually start signing up, it will be hard for me to give it that more personal touch. Uh, and again. From there, um, I thank you all for watching this course. I hope this was very, very helpful to you all. And at any given moment, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to add a question on Udemy. Also, please absolutely rate my course. And I'd like to thank everyone for watching the course. And I hope that you've gotten a lot of information from here. And I'll hopefully be talking to you guys soon. So we want to close out this course by going through the very beginning and kind of going over some things that we kind of talked about on each one of these topics and each one of these courses to kind of have an overview of everything. So remember, starting off from the beginning, we talked about what the first ICND1 and the ICND2 exams were. Pretty much if you got the first one that means you're a CSENT but we're really going for the CCNA so you need to take both exams you need to knock them out the park and when I mean knock them out the park I mean get them done doesn't mean you have to get a great score a passing score is a passing score now of course it'd be nice to get a score of 999 or even 1000 I mean love to give those scores but in the end a, pass, a CCNA is a CCNA you don't get a CCNA with a score no one's going to look at you as a CCNA and say, well, you know, you might be a CCNA, man, but you only got a score of, of, of 815 or 802. So, sorry, buddy. We're not going to hire you. They, they're not going to know. So, now, our CCNA is only prep for what? Our CCMP. Guys, if you're in the networking field, and this is why you're doing this, you're getting your CCNA to get into the networking field, your CCNA is only designed for you to get your CCMP. It's only designed as a stepping stone, as the basics for you to learn your CCMP. Professional level is where you want to be. There's lots of people that will argue this fact with you, and I have convinced many, and I mean many people, to go for their CCMP. A CCMP. Their lives have changed drastically. It's a whole new world. Whole new types of jobs come your way with a CCMP. Okay? We talked about the passing score as far as if you are only 100 points away, that's a positive, not a negative. That means whatever you've done up to this point got you that many points, which means you're doing the right thing. You're on the right track. It doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. It means you're doing something right. So that's very, very, very important to understand. We talked about how many questions were on the exam, which is pretty much uh, 45 to 50, or 40 to 50 questions. 
We talked about the needing material, how important books really are. Books are definitely a necessity. Cisco Press has these books. I can't say that I can't say they're they're a perfect book for you. And I strongly suggest that you pre-read these books in some fashion, maybe go on Safari or something, and be able to have a look at these books before you make it before you actually purchase them. Read everyone has their own writing style. You need to be able to understand this writing style. If you're not learning from reading, the book's not going to help you. You might as well not have bought the book at all. Routing TCP IP is a very good book to have. Too much for CCNA to start off with, but I'm not going to knock you for buying it. And it's definitely an awesome book to have on yourself. It's definitely a must book that you should highly consider when you're going to your CCNP to buy this book. I say a must high consider. Doesn't mean you have to have it. But I would. CCIE, definitely a must-have. you got to have this book. Computer-based training is very, very, very important for your training, which is why you're listening to this course as we speak. Some people will lean towards the book. Some people will lean towards the computer-based training. Whatever you do, just make sure it's consistent. We talked about what you really need if you wanted to buy equipment. Remember, an access server is not needed. If you do not have an access server, I want you to think about this now. If you have three routers, router one, router two, and router three, and three switches, okay? And you got these connected all together some some way shape or form doesn't really matter you have to log into these devices now on the back of these devices are console cables I'm gonna make it a nice little plug here console ports I should say and these console ports is where your console cable plugs into each one of them has it now ideally it would be nice to only have to log into one device. So if you're just using, here's your PC sitting here. If you only have one USB to serial, here be your USB to serial here. If you only have one USB to serial, that means you're going to plug your console cable in here into this and have this plugged into the back of router one. Well, whenever you need to go to router two, you're going to have to unplug it from router router one and bring it over here to router two. And when you're done with that, you need to plug unplug it. So whatever device you want to go into, you're going to have to unplug it from the previous device and put it in there. Now, it's two ways of getting around this. One, buy a USB serial adapter for every device, which means you have six of these coming out of your computer and you just plug them in which means at that point you'll have com uh com three com four because most likely it won't start off with com one most likely you'll have com one and two on your computer and the drivers installed so uh, you know it might start off with com three so we'll say com three four five six seven eight well this is fine and you just run those devices over to your ports and just have them sit there and whenever you bring up your terminal session which will either be putty or secure crt putty's free so most likely you'll be using putty i would i wouldn't pay for it i would definitely use putty to start off there's nothing wrong with that and you'll be able to connect to them all that's one way the other way is buying an access server Now, if you buy an access server, what an access server, all it is, is a router. It's a router that has this expansion card that you put in here. And that card, now you can actually buy the 2500s. That's automatically an access server. It has these on the back of them. Or you can buy the modules that slides into your router. 
and it's going to have these interesting long cables that plug in. And on the back of those cables, on the back of these ports, is going to be what we call an octo cable. And that octo cable, one, one plugs in here, boom, like so. And then out of this device comes eight cables. Hence the word octa. We got four at the top, and then we'll have four here at the bottom, underneath here. And those cables will go out and they'll plug into your devices, like so. Now the nice thing about this is how are you going to get to this device? Well now your console cable plugs in kind of hop over these wires here and plugs into your router. And instead of this really being a console cable here it's not going to be a console cable anymore. Uh, actually, I erased the wrong thing, but it's not going to be. It's not going to be a console cable that plugs in there anymore. It's just going to be your fast Ethernet that plugs into here. And goes into your fast Ethernet port here. This will have an IP address, we'll say 192.168.1.4, and this one will have 192.168.1.10. You would actually tell that over to this device, and then this device, you connect to this device, which allows you to connect to all these devices here. And the nice thing about it is you can have four, all six windows open, putty session windows open, with all the routers all at once. That's great. It's fantastic. It's lovely. So if you want to use an access server, that's fine. But these access servers can be kind of costly if you buy them as already access servers. Which means they're like, a, they could be a couple hundred bucks. If you buy the module, I think the module is like 70 bucks, I think. That's how much it costs. And you just plug it in, you automatically got the ports. You just got to get directions on how to get it set up. So this is beautiful. But remember, besides all this, let's say you don't use an access server. You definitely need three routers. Minimum three switches. I prefer, I prefer four. It's a very good uh, spanning tree lesson. And remember, remember, guys, we're here to learn. We're not here to skip by. We're here to learn. But you can still learn spinning tree with three switches, but it's recommended. my recommendation to use four. You're going to need WIC 1 or WIC 2 T cards to give you your serial connections. You're going to need your DCE, DTE cables. That actually is what plugs into your serial cards. These are your cables, your serial cables. You're definitely going to need straight through Cat5 or Cat6 cable. Cat6 is fine. Those straight through. And you're going to definitely need some Cat5 or Cat6 crossovers. Now... And don't forget, obviously, at the bottom of your USB to serial adapter. Now, I need to tell you this because it's very important to understand that you can make these cables if you want. If you want to try to save some money and make your cables, that's fine. But I'm telling you, it is best to use your uh, cables that are already factory crimped. Not your cables. I was almost going to say it's best to use your own cables, but no, it's not. It's best to use factory-made cables. Now, what's the worst thing happens? You go out, you buy yourself a crimp, or you use the crimp that you have, make your own cables, and you have problems. Hey, there's nothing wrong with that, because now you got yourself a troubleshooting session. And then eventually you come to find out that it's just, just even though you did a great job crimping, somehow 
You know, it just didn't work. Now, let's be honest, guys. When you're buying these devices off eBay, like, uh, you know, a, a, a thousand or 500 or 200 RJ45 connectors, I, guys, they're cheap. That's why they're being sold on eBay, and that's why you bought them for cheap. I mean, they're cheap, to, they're cheap ones. You know, and you go on Home Depot and spend a lot of money for them. Yeah, you, yeah you're yeah, you saying to yourself, man, these aren't worth it. Until you're not, but they are better quality. I'm not saying they're great quality, and I'm not saying you're you're not overpaying. But it's better than the ones you get off eBay. Uh, I've had those things crimp and just, you know, three days later, just die on me. So you got to keep that in mind. I like the factory ones. I've, I, you know, I crimped my own. Yes, I did have trouble, and it got me to the point of buying my own cables. But it was a cool troubleshooting session. It was the first time I ended up using my uh, my my cable thing, the, the cable thing to check to plug it into each side to find out if the pins are matching up, and realized that one of the pins was just just not. Even though it was all the way back and looking great, it was just some reason it would work here and it wouldn't work there. I just sat there and watched it for like three minutes, and I noticed that sometimes it would go off, sometimes it wouldn't. And I found out I had a bad cable. Switched the cable, never had a problem out of it. So just keep that in mind. My the study schedule, guys. Get on it. Literally get on it. Do not hinder yourself by not having a schedule. Your schedule is the most crucial thing ever. Always has been, always will be. I like to see four hours a week. I mean, four hours a day. I like to see you on Saturdays and Sundays, first thing in the morning. Same time you get up Monday through Friday, which means you're going to bed on Friday. Your sacrifices are going to be no gaming, no games, no friends, no parties. If this is who you are, friends, parties, games, and you can't sacrifice these things, your CCNA isn't the priority. Your CCNA must be priority over all these things. Now, I'm not saying neglect your family, but you get the idea. You need to draw the line. When I started my CCIE training, you know what I told all my friends? I'll see you next year. And that's not a lie. That's what I told every one of them. I'll see you guys next year. See ya. And a couple of them just, just like laughed at me. I'm like, dude, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding at all. It's like, what do you mean you'll see me next year? I'm like, dude, if you want to talk to me, the only way you're going to be able to talk to me is via chat. And I can't guarantee you that I'm going to respond all the time. When I get my CCMP, I just disappeared for like four months. Now, I told my buddy I was disappearing. Not not, not the word disappear, but I told him, look, man, my CCMP is coming up soon. And, um, you know, I'm going to be going back to my studying hardcore. You're not going to hear from me for a while. He's like, oh, really? And then next thing you know, two weeks later, boom, shh, I was gone. Disconnected my phone. I don't want to, you know, because my buddy wasn't using email. He's not really a technology guy, which is kind of weird in, in, in nowadays. And next thing you know, what happens? He, you know, I call him up four, you know, four months later. He's like, oh my god, I thought, you know, I mean, the the boy was really hurt, and I'm like, I'm sorry, dude. You know, I I, I was on a mission, and I'll do it again. Now I'm not telling you to be like me, and I'm not telling you to do that. But sacrifices are needed. And I and I let him know that was going to happen. I just didn't give him every day play by play that what was happening. So this schedule is very crucial. Saturday and Sundays are your days to have fun, and you can easily have fun. Get your studying done first thing in the morning. Do not forget it. It is crucial. One hundred percent crucial. Now, the nice thing about this is our next subject actually gets on things that are pretty interesting. We start finally getting into network fundamentals. Uh, the beginning of this course is kind of, 
you know, somewhat dry material because we're kind of like going through the steps of the exam, going to look it up. And this, this part really isn't that fun to me. So I'm kind of stuttering a lot when I'm doing these things. But you, you'll start to see the excitement and start to see the change in my voice when we start talking about equipment and, and the study schedule. Um, you know, this, going through this, you know, that's kind of, even kind of going through the materials like this, this really, this is not when I really get excited. When I really start getting excited, you'll start to see what's coming out of me is when you start seeing a studying course, you know, uh, the missing parts. And now, you know, we're going to kind of stay with this momentum and this, and this energy level when I start talking about the technology now. And that's, that's where I should be flowing a lot better. They're still studying in my studies. <laughs> Did I, is that a tongue twister? They're, they're still studying, uh, stuttering in my studies. Uh, not in my studies, though. That's the proper word, uh, improper word. There is still stuttering in my teachings. That's what I should have said. And that's because my brain is, is, is a little odd. It, it's, I have ideas of what I'm trying to say, and there's lots of them in there. And then I go to write something, and then I'm trying to speak and write at the same time. It's just a bad combination. You know, and, and my brain, my you know, <laughs> my brain isn't that smart. I can't just do two things at once at the same time. You know, and of course, our brains are what? Processors. So... Obviously, I'm trying to process one thing when trying to do the other, and something has to give. And I do that all the time. So there's a lot of studying, making sure I say the right keywords. And, and that is the hard part of a teacher, making sure the right keywords are said. Because the wrong keyword can make you go off track. There's a lot of times I say things, thinking that I said one thing, but I really was supposed to say something else. So that happens a lot, too. But nonetheless, the course will start to gear up here now. We'll start to get into some more interesting things. And I wanted to thank you for uh, taking the time to watch the intro to this course. And we'll see you on the next video.